Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Tanya Fernandez Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the Chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded. It is being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city council, sorry, city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Files Channel 964. The Council's budget review process will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April and running through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can, <clears throat> you can do this in several ways. Attend one of our hearings and give public testimony. We will take public testimony at each department hearing and also at two hearings dedicated to public testimony. The full hearing schedule is on our website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. That's boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Our scheduled hearings dedicated to public testimony are April 26 at 6 p.m. and June 2nd at 6 p.m. Um, you can give testimony in person here in the chamber or virtual via Zoom. For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up on the sheet near the entrance. For virtual testimony, you can sign up using online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at cccw.w, sorry, that's cccwm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation or re res residence and limit your comments to a few minutes to ensure that, limit your comments to two minutes, please, to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. Email your written testimony to the committee uh, at ccc.wm at boston.gov or submit a two minute video or of your testimony through the form on our website. For more information on the City Council budget process and how to testify, please visit the City Council's budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Today's hearing is on docket 0480 to, excuse me, 0482 orders for the FY23 operating budget, including annual operations for departmental operations for the school department and for po other post-employment benefits, OPEP. Dockets 0483, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. Dockets 0484 to 0486, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Our focus area for this hearing will be Boston Public Schools overview. Our panelists for today's hearings are BPS Superintendent Brenda Casellas, um, which I am noting that she is only available for um, the first hour. Um, BPS, sorry, uh, Superintendent Casellas, does that include the time that we've already taken from you? Okay, thank you. Um, BPS Chief Financial Officer Nate Cooter, BPS Dep Deputy Chief Financial Officer David Bloom, BPS Deputy Superintendent of Ac Academics Drew Etchelson. Okay. I'll be representing the academic. Our Deputy Chief Academic Officer. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry. Farah, I have you here, Deputy Chief Academic Officer Farah. Asaraj and BPS Senior Advisor Megan Costello. I think I just, I'm missing, just, did I say your name already? I did. Oh, there you are. Okay, David Bloom. Thank you. Um, I am joined today by my colleagues, Counselor um, President Ed Flynn, Counselor at Large Aaron Murphy, Counselor Ruzi Lujan, <sighs> Counselor Kenzie Bach, Counselor Liz Braden, and Counselor Julia Mejia, and Counselor Kendra Lara. Um, all right, we'll, we can go straight into um, 
admin presentations. Um, and the way this is going to work is that there are five of you, so split your 20 minutes as you can. Hopefully it's about three and a half minutes each. Um, and then we will do first rounds with the counselors, five minutes each, including your responses. It's on them to moderate how much time they allow you to take to respond. Then we will go into public testimony where we'll allow them only two minutes. Then we'll come back to a second round with the counselors um, where they'll um, probably take another five minutes each, even though we'd like it to be three. Um, and then we'll see how much time we have left and we'll go from there. All right. Uh, you have the floor for your presentation. Good morning and thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing us to be here today to talk about this very exciting budget. Um, it's wonderful to be with all the counselors here in person and to be able to see your beautiful faces for the first time. I want to acknowledge you, Madam Chair, for your leadership and thank you so much for uh, um, your leadership during this really difficult time in our city. I also want to thank um, Ed Chair Julia Mejia for her um, hearings and for her interest in, in leadership in the education uh, realm and support that she's been giving to us personally and also to the entire school district and our children. I've been working alongside my amazing finance team here, um, Chief Nate Cooter, uh, David Bloom, uh, Deputy Chief Financial Officer, and also uh, Farah Asaraj, Drew Eccleson on the academic side, and Senior Advisor Megan Costello. There's also folks in the um, wings ready to support us if we have uh, any other deeper questions and technical questions that we can't answer, but they can because they're the experts in their field. Today I'm also going to be uh, talking about our budget, um, the fiscal year 2023 budget for Boston Public Schools, which is guided by the belief that every child in every classroom and every school deserves an excellent and equitable education. They just uh, have gone through the most difficult two years, um, almost two and a half years now of the pandemic, which we all have gone through. And um, we have been fortunate to be able to have increases every year in our budget, thanks to the city council and the leadership of several mayors. Um, with a $100 million commitment made over three years ago by Mayor Walsh, it was affirmed by Mayor Janey and also by Mayor Wu now um, adding 40 million this school year. These positions have been able to position the school district in a way that has provided for additional supports during this time when children have uh, experienced um, many mental health uh, crises within the school, academic losses, uh, and major disruptions to their educational programming. So I am uh, very appreciative to this body and to the city of Boston for prioritizing its children um, in, its, in its commitments um, and in financial commitments to the school. I also want to um, be able to share just some of the framing that we have been using on our uh, budget, which is return, recover, and reimagine. We chose these three pieces because when we were first uh, initiating the $100 million commitment, the return, uh, returning was a very important piece for all of us getting back to school from remote learning. And then of course, we are now in the recovery phase, phase and then we are shifting to reimagining uh, our public schools and what we can do to better support our kids and provide a more equitable and excellent education for every single one of our students. It also represents, the, this, this year's budget represents the final installment of this three-year commitment that gets us to $110 million annual <coughs> increase above and beyond any salary increases or increases over the maintenance costs. The reason that this is so important is because this is funding that goes directly to supporting students and their continued success. It's the funding schools have needed to continue to ensure we get our students what they need especially as we recover from the uh, impacts of this pandemic. Um, this year we are really focusing on a few key things. One is um, to be able to con continue to have stability for our students during the pandemic. So there's a $50 million uh, hold harmless in this budget for our schools. Obviously we can't continue to do that uh, because of declining enrollment. However, it is critical that we do it over these next few years as we stabilize uh, enrollment for, for, um, for
for our schools and then also stabilize the care and the attention needed for them to succeed academically. Um, as uh, educators, of course, we continue to look and adapt for how we are gonna support our kids in their social emotional learning. So we have provided for additional counselors in this budget, psychologists for the mental health supports that are needed, as well as um, additional supports for uh, academics, interventions, and <coughs> curriculum purchases that we will do. This will match um, and support our ESSER investments as well. As you know, we have over $400 million that is over a three-year period that the federal government has given uh, to Boston Public Schools, and we're using that funding to augment some of the other uh, investments that we're making, such as libraries, arts investments, athletic investments, and improvements in equitable literacy. All of this really gets to one of the really key pieces of this is anchoring a quality guarantee for every single student in every single public school uh, in Boston Public Schools. This is looking at additions to the budget that will add to the budget from the past two years where we've added family liaisons, we've added social workers, we've added uh, psychologists. This year we're adding counselors. We've also added nurses in every single school, paraprofessionals at the kindergarten level. Uh, and we will be making investments now in athletics, like I said, additional ninth grade counseling. And we passed uh, graduation requirements across all of our high schools so we'll be implementing a higher rigorous mass core uh, programming for our students. This year will be the first year with our ninth graders that we will be implementing it, and then it'll be ninth and 10th grade, then 9, 10, 11, until we get to uh, phasing in fully for uh, our 12th graders. Um, so this is incredibly important as we raise rigor and raise the opportunity for all of our students, particularly with a focus on equity so that all of our kids are getting the quality guarantee that we are knowing that they need to succeed. I also wanna share that this matches closely with creating um, academic pathways and the capital investments that we hope to make with our facilities. As part of our quality guarantee, you have both the academic side, the social emotional side, and also we wanna be sure that we're sending our children to the school buildings that they deserve, school buildings that are rich, in opportunities as well as uh, beautiful spaces um, that meet their health and safety needs. So um, as you know, over the pandemic, we have also fixed 12,000 windows, we've fixed venting in our classrooms, we've fixed sinks and temperatures of water flow. They will be getting clean water for clean water stations. And also um, we have provided for air conditioning to go in and hopefully that will be finished by this uh, December. I think that these improvements provided by the city are improvements that are needed and long overdue, and I'm incredibly grateful to this body for your approval of our capital budget and improvements for our students, as well as the operating improvements that we will discuss today. One final thing that I would like to share is that we continue to look for efficiencies within our budget, whether they're efficiencies at central office, or efficiencies that we can make in transportation or food nutrition services so that we can be sure that we're good stewards of the public uh, funding and that um, we're placing it as closely to the students and the teachers that need it the most. Um, and we wanna make sure that students are getting what they need. And that means that you have to be efficient with the dollars, responsible with the money that the city has provided so that um, it's working directly toward providing an excellent opportunity for every single one of our students. So on behalf of the BPS team and our educators, our uh, teachers, our paraprofessionals, our support staff, I thank you again for your partnership and your support to our students and their families. And I'll turn it over to Nate Pooter. Thank you, Superintendent. You have your remaining of 13 minutes. That's great. Uh, I'll take less than that. Um, thank, you. thank you, and I'm excited to be here to present the FY23 budget um, on behalf of Superintendent Caselius in the Boston Public Schools. This $1.3 billion budget represents significant resources and opportunities for our students and schools and includes over $40 million in new investments uh, for our students. We start every presentation around the budget with this statement from the Opportunity Achievement Gap Policy. And what we hope to explain over the next five or six hearings is how equity is embedded in all of our budgeting decisions and is rooted in the idea that what we want is for all students, regardless of background, uh, disability status, immigration status, um, language abilities, 
We want them to be able to succeed and have the resources they need to succeed. And this budget does invest more um, and uh, in our students who need it the most and who have been most affected by the pandemic. Um, you'll note on this presentation that there's a difference slightly from the presentation that you've received. I've narrowed it down to just a few key highlighted slides in the interest of time. Um, but of course, we're here and ready to answer any questions about the resources we provided and which will be available online. We also started this budget presentation by identifying three key challenges. And I'm going to introduce um, the Deputy Chief Academic Officer, Farah Asaraj, to be able to walk you through each of these as an anchoring part in the budget process for this year. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for um, allowing us to share our updates as well as our priorities. In relation to our investments, we have identified three key major areas. Clearly, there is much more that we could um, identify, but these are the priorities that we uh, must respond to that so that every student, not just some, but that every student meets the mass core participation. Uh, so one of the challenges is the variability in student opportunity to meet the adopted mass core graduation requirements. We anticipate the investments will support us in achieving that outcome for our high school students by implementing the mass core starting in the ninth grade in addition to providing additional ninth grade counselors. Our second challenge around academic outcomes for our especially multilingual students with disabilities, students with disabilities are also multilingual students. Um, students who are black and Latino and those who are most on the margins. Our average daily attendance has decreased um, since COVID. And our MAP, which is our uh, in-house BPS assessment as well as MCAS, um, certainly has identified the gaps and the disproportionality of outcomes for students in comparison to their white and Asian peers. We are going to be investing in bilingual supports and increasing our bilingual education programs, in addition to expanding our academic counseling in K-8, and to reimagine schools' practices and structures for students with disabilities so they can thrive academically, in addition to the investments in equitable literacy. And lastly, our challenge with quality guarantees so that, as the superintendent has clearly described, uh, and the mayor in support of every student that we need to take action to provide all of our students the full set of quality guarantees from academics, enrichment, facilities, student and family support. We intend on expanding access to libraries. There is a huge investment um, on way in addition to uh, ensuring that students have access to multilingual and bilingual texts and books. Additionally, expanding our social emotional supports and investing in high quality facilities. For the sake of time, I'm going to turn it back to my colleagues. Thank you very much. Having a little uh, advancing problems. It's over by. Okay. Um, as the superintendent mentioned, this represents a three year, $110 million investment in the Boston Public Schools. And so we are fortunate from the support of the City Council to be able to invest more resources in our schools. Um, the $110 million represents spending over and above our cost increases. And so this is true investment in new services and supports for students. Um, as part of that, on the next slide, it shows the superintendent referenced nearly $50 million, the $49 million in soft landings. What we have done throughout this pandemic is stabilize the school experience for our students and make sure that this instability that we felt as a community caused by COVID-19 is not also felt in our schools by changes to services and supports. The net result of that is an increase in overall cost per pupil. And this has been something that I know that you've been having conversations with your constituents about and thinking about this um, challenge of declining enrollment in a period of increased investment. And so as part of that, I wanted to highlight, we're about to launch a new project to reimagine school funding in Boston. 
We've had weighted student funding or student-based budgeting as part of our district for over 10 years. We're gonna be partnering with Afton Partners and UPD Consulting to do a community engagement process to rethink what is it that we have for a vision for our schools and how does our funding support that. So wanted to make sure you're all aware of this. Um, I'm saying it in every opportunity I have publicly to make sure that people participate because this is a real opportunity to shape the way our schools will be funded for the next 10 years, um, which I think is a, a tremendous opportunity. The framework, of course, as the superintendent mentioned, is return, recover, and reimagine. What we need to do is make sure that our strong, we're returning strong, recovering well, and reimagining education in an ever-changing world. To that end, we have $6, six million dollars in investments in operating an ESSER to invest in return. $35 million is focused on recovery. This is a big part of our work, is to make sure students um, are able to recover and have the supports they need. And $10 million in investments in reimagining. Facilities has been a huge topic of conversation centrally, um, excuse me, with our school committee, and I'm sure with your constituents as well. To that end, we're investing both in facilities repairs, in indoor air quality, and temperature control. We're also investing in our capacity to move forward large projects. The superintendent mentioned the capital investments. We're very excited about this year's capital budget and what it means for new buildings and major projects. And we're staffing our teams to make sure that we're successfully implementing those projects. We've talked uh, again about the growth in soft landings. Wanted to highlight that this is something that has been part of our pandemic response strategy and has also been shown to be um, an investment in schools that serve disproportionately high rates of um, black and Latinx students. And so what we have done is continue to stabilize schools with declining enrollment. We've experienced significant enrollment of declines over the last five years, nearly 7,000 students, going from just about 56,000 students to below about 49,000 students. During that period of instability, we need to have a difficult conversation as a district and as a city about the portfolio of schools, their size, and the distribution across the city. In the meantime, we wanted to make sure that we were not continuously chipping away at the student experience. And so when we look at that investment, it's really focused on stabilizing the environment for students. And then, of course, our investment in um, the quality guarantee. This has been a three-year project and an impressive list of new resources at every school. When we say we want to make sure there are certain opportunities and experiences that exist at every school, regardless of enrollment, regardless of composition of students, and it includes social workers, family liaisons, instructional facilitators. This year, it's an expansion of librarians and library resources, expanding school psychologists to meet and exceed the national standard of 500, um, one school psychologist for every 500 students and high school guidance counselors in ninth grade to make sure our students are on track to graduate and receiving the support they need to complete Mass Corps. These are major investments in student supports and are necessary for um, closing achievement gaps and helping students recover from the pandemic. Um, this slide, which is not displaying too well on the screens, um, I often refer to as, if you're gonna look at our budget in one table, this is the table. We break it up into four major categories. The first category, direct school expenses. That's money that you will find directly on school budgets, whether you're looking at the GRU school or the Curly. You're gonna be able to find those expenses. It's the, mostly teachers, curriculum materials, and staff at the schools. Um, the second category is what we call school services budgeted centrally. That refers to items that are on a central office budget but you'll find in schools. So it's not actually people walking around the bowling building. This includes things like occupational therapists and physical therapists, which are budgeted out of our special education office, and all of our custodians, which are budgeted in our central office for facilities, but are allocated directly to schools. That third category is central administration. This is the central office, the CFO's budget and uh, my salary, the superintendent's salary. And then the last category, which is um, important for people to understand, is non-BPS student services. This is the budget that we have for City of Boston residents who are enrolled in non-BPS schools, but are services that we provide and are legally obligated to provide. It includes uh, charter school transportation and out-of-district special education spending. 
And then finally, in the interest of um, making sure there's tons of resources available for people to find online, if you go to bostonpublicschools.org slash budget, you'll find this presentation as well as um, all of the presentations we've given to the school committee, a full um, budget in Excel that people can download, and there's also an explore budget tool where you can go and view all of our budget broken down by all the students affected. So you can see how the transportation department breaks up their spending by traditional yellow bus service versus special education services, or you can see how the academics team invests in curriculum versus coaching supports. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to um, Councillor Fernandez Anderson um, and look forward to your questions. And I'm Thank you. I think I beat it by like 30 seconds. No, you actually have a minute and a half left. Did you oh. want to say more? <laughs> okay. I'll, say, I'll take that question <laughs> since I rushed. Did you want to no, continue? Thank you. We'll, okay. we'll take your questions. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Uh, typically, I just go to my council colleagues um, first. And Councillor uh, Flynn, if you're, if you're ready, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for your leadership, Madam Chair, and working closely with the Bull administration and the BPS team that is here. And I also want to say thank you to the BPS team, to the superintendent, for the important work that you've done, superintendent, over the last several years, especially during the pandemic. It's been an extremely difficult period for everyone in the city, but you've provided strong leadership and just want to say thank you to you superintendent um so my, my question is basically well i have two two questions or comments can you talk about students with disabilities um, what type of investments are we making for students with disabilities as it relates to giving them a little bit of support towards um, athletics, physical therapy, counseling, um, and those types of service, social services. W why is this, how is this budget helping students with disabilities? Um, that's a great question. I really, I really do appreciate that. Um, in terms of a, the overall investment, we have been multi-year investment in, in inclusive opportunities for students in the classroom. Um, and the district-wide rollout of inclusion is now in its second year of high school. And so um, what you see in most of our investments in special education is in that category, and then in compensatory services. Um, in terms of uh, adapting athletics uh, for special education, I think that's something that I'll need to come back to you with um, after talking with our athletics department, and we'll definitely have an answer for that um, as it relates to um, the hearing on athletics later this month. I don't know if there's anything anyone else would add or. Um, just that we are investing in the UDL, which is Universal Design for Learning, um, to support our inclusion classrooms. That is a huge initiative that um, has been uh, supported by Department of Education in Massachusetts, in addition to expanding inclusive um, opportunities, uh, because there are programs for really inclusive practices should be across every classroom, so that expansion and building on the K-8 strand and really focusing on ensuring that the secondary level has inclusive, inclusion models in addition to inclusive practices across the content classrooms and courses. Speak to the dyslexia in Oh, absolutely. Um, and we have been engaged in the dyslexia um, work group this year. Um, the state has required that every district in this, um, uh, across the state uh, ensures that there's a diagnostic tool. Um, so we have been implementing universal screeners, um, also leading uh, in the MTSS, which is our multi tier system of support work. Part of that is a district curriculum accommodation plan. Um, and so what that does, it actually identifies across the spectrum for students pre-referral. Um, and so we're engaging in what the universal screeners are telling us in addition to training and as well as providing um, additional screeners and support for educators in schools, as well as the IEP teams and the COSIS so that they are trained and they're working with our language assessment team facilitators. And those are the folks at the school level who also oversee our English learners. And so they do have 
uh, professional learning in which they are, um, really are dissecting the intersectionality of language versus a language disability, for example, or communication disorders. So we are looking to expand more around professional learning as well as um, supports in, for our L's with disabilities in addition to that. Thank, thank you, and Superintendent, you, so you, what your team did was you provided testing um, services to determine if someone had dyslexia. Um, you provide it now at an earlier age or an earlier grade than, than before. Um, I remember working with you on this issue several, several years ago, but that's, that's what one of the things you guys did is that's, you know, okay. What grade does that start at, uh, Superintendent? Do you, do we remember? They start early on with the dyslexia screeners with the MAP. Um, assessment, but yes. there is more technical on that. So just any student who enters our district, mm -hmm. um, if they have any identified sort of needs, obviously with dyslexia there is a particular diagnosis as well as um, assessments and battery of assessments that are provided. So sometimes students are referred to special education very early in early childhood. Clearly we know that there is a variability in development in early childhood between, let's say, when they enter at a K-0 versus a first grade. And so really it has to do with what are the developmentally appropriate approaches and in instruction, in addition to when students start to learn, for example, you know, letter sounds and writing, and it starts to demonstrate itself. Um, so there is generally a higher diagnosis at later years, so K2, first grade, and so on, when it, it becomes more um, prevalent and present in terms of the instruction. Thank you, and my, my final question or comment for this round, um, what are we doing for, um, students that may, may have disabilities, but also their parents might not speak um, English as a first language. Um, how, are we com how are we interacting and getting the parents and the families involved with wraparound services for their, for their child? Absolutely, um, great question. That is certainly an area that I think we still need to continue to make progress in. All of the um, IEP information is provided in the ed plan, which is what we use. Um, there is a translation as well as a, a requirement. So we've communicated to all school leaders, educators, uh, clearly the COSAs, that if there is any indication that a family um, is in need of interpretation, that that is a legal requirement. So we've actually invested in our translation interpretation department um, and have seen a tremendous use of, um, of that opportunity across the system, especially during COVID. Um, and so what we need to make sure to do is that we cannot uh, obviously hold a meeting without the parents' primary language. And so we, I think we're trying to also add additional mitigation um, strategies to make sure that there is follow through and that the parents were asked what their primary language is. But certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilor Murphy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the hearing. Um, and thank you to BPS for being here. Um, important hearing for sure. Um, as a former BPS teacher before I landed this job, you all know I was a Boston Public School teacher for over 20 years, special education inclusion teacher, ESL certified, and then my last few years was a special ed coordinator. And we know supporting our special ed students and families during COVID it continues to be traumatic for many of our students and families and staff and also Lots of, um, I have a few questions that I hope um, will be addressed today or at later meetings, but I just want to go down the list of questions I have. Are we, um, could you explain more about how we're investing in behavior supports for all of our students? After school programming, specifically for our special ed students, we know that many of our students are not able to stay in some of the after school programming that's provided at the school level. Um, also equitable before and after school programming across the district. Reading supports, um, you started to mention dyslexia. Thank you, Councilor Flynn, for bringing that up. Are we following the mandated dyslexia guidelines? You mentioned the screening, because I know as a special ed teacher and then also a special ed coordinator, we never allow dyslexia to be a diagnosis. And then, so we're screening, but are we making sure that we're training and have Orton Gillingham trained teachers and is that written into the IEPs and are we providing that? And on a budget question, I would love to know how much do we spend on students who are placed out of district to K-12 
get that required training because oftentimes we send students to Carroll or other schools because BPS doesn't provide the proper training. And we often know that it's only families who know to advocate for that that get those opportunities to get the district to pay for them to be placed out of district, to get the training. I know many teachers are Orton Gillingham trained or would love to be, so it's not that we don't have the talent pool here in BPS. So, and then also, um, also, oh, I filed two hearings. I'm the chair of public health and right off on the mental health crisis our students are having. So would love to know not just the social workers or guidance counselors, are we going to implement some training, not just for our staff, but curriculum around mental health needs in our school. And then also, how much more than the $71 per student are we investing in this new budget for athletics? You did mention that we'll have a specific athletic hearing coming up, but I really do think we need to look at the holistic approach of our students and making sure that we're offering athletics and arts and all other, um, and not think of them as extra curriculum, but during the day, this need through the mental health crisis our students are suffering through is needed now more than ever. So those are my questions for now. There's a lot of questions in there, there Councilor is. Murphy. And I know I that we'll um, more. on Thursday we'll go in depth, I think, on special education. On Monday, um, Ms. Costello is just showing me that on the mental health support services. Mm -hmm. um, after school programming, um, I don't know, Nate, if you want to speak Thank to that just uh, briefly and then behavioral supports. Um, Farah, if you'd like to just speak sure. to what we're doing there. Yeah, for before and after school programming, um, there's an ESSER investment, and ESSER refers to our federal stimulus funds mm -hmm. um, that we're getting over the next three years. There's $9 million over those three years to expand um, access, because we, we know that we do not have consistent support for before and after school programs across schools. Um, so that's, that's something the superintendent has been talking about probably since day one mm -hmm. about the need to make sure that it's not just about which schools are entrepreneurial, but making sure that's part of our quality guarantee. So that nine million, I don't have an answer about the specific, um, uh, how it'll adapt for, for students with disabilities, but we can mm -hmm. follow up on that. Um, for, you also asked about behavioral supports, um, and I think uh, the, the social emotional learning team is coming back to do a presentation. Specifically, and I think we've gotten this question before around how that's being embedded in the curriculum and is not just about counseling services. Um, but what we've tried to do is expand social workers, school psychologists, those mental health supports that are not based on necessarily a student's IEP. So it's not required that a student um, has the services written in before they start to get support and think about the whole school environment, um, creating safer, more welcoming environments, those that are trauma informed, so that it's not just about an individual student of creating that sort of tier one support across. Um, so that's that's the role partially of the school um, school social workers and um, when Elich um, Tembora, our assistant superintendent for that team comes, she'll be able to speak about it obviously more eloquently. Um, and then in terms of athletics. Yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, good morning, counselors. Um, so our school committee approved budget has approximately $98 per pupil um, for athletics before our ESSER investment. Um, and we anticipate another 1.4 million, about $28 per pupil um, coming on ESSER for a total of $126 per pupil in the final plan spending. How long will that extra funding from I'm ESSER sorry, um, will that Council run Murphy, out? we're gonna move on and then we'll do a second round. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council Lujan. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I just want to thank um, members of the administration for being here and answering our questions. I'm encouraged by a lot of the additional spending when it comes to mental health supports, when it comes to exceeding um, the national standards for guidance counselors and uh, psychiatrists. I hadn't seen that exceeding number before in the presentation. It seemed as we were trying to meet the baseline national standards, so questions on that later. Um, I really have three buckets of questions. The first one is about human capital and stabilizing leadership in uh, both central office and at our schools. Um, but I'll focus more sort of on principles. We know that stability in our school settings is very important. Um, and we see a lot of attrition, uh, especially for leaders of color who 
are trying their best. And I just want to hear more, how are we investing in stable leadership in our schools? I know that we had been doing partnering with the Lynch Leadership Academy, but what else are we doing? How are we wrapping around our principles and, our, um, and, and what are we doing in central staff? to really build, and, and, and I know there's a lot of churn obviously right now, but we need to be make sure that we're centering what needs to happen in central office in our schools, not based on a new superintendent, not based on anything else, but really responding to student need. And so I just wanna hear about both what we're doing at the individual school level and in central office. We'll have a hearing on that as well, so. When is that hearing? Well, I can just start answering, you know, um, supporting principals is really about their working conditions and making sure that they feel valued and that they feel empowered to do their work. And so I think, you know, it's just the superintendent making her, herself available, having support from the school superintendents uh, who oversee and supervise principals, making sure that that's a supportive relationship, making sure that they have the resources, like budgets, to be able to do the work and the and the teams that we've been able to put around superintendents, um, oftentimes or, or principals, oftentimes they feel uh, really alone in the work um, mm -hmm. and on the front line. And so, having social workers, having counselors, having psychologists, having family liaisons there to support them as a team um, really does help them to persist in the role as a, as a principal. And then we have a lot of professional development. This Thursday, we'll have a professional development all day for our principals. We have um, opportunities, like you mentioned, through the Lynch leadership to um, gain additional credentialing and experience. We have uh, cohorts. We do fireside chats with them. I do personally fireside chats with them in their regions, meet with them uh, personally one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so I think that those things are the kind of things that really value them. And then right now we're actually rewriting their contract um, to be more beneficial to them and um, so that they have um, time in their contract that identifies their professional development, it identifies um, the, the working conditions that they have. And so I think that providing for a fairer, um, more um, beneficial contract to them is gonna help them feel more valued as well. Thank you, Superintendent. Um, I'm gonna you know, put an asterisk by credentialing because I think that's an important conversation. We hear it a, a lot amongst uh, teachers and leaders of color that it can also, credentialing was great to provide avenues. Uh, requiring re credentials where not necessarily can be a hindrance to a lot of advancement and to be able to attract talent of color. So, but my second question is really around English language learners, um, especially when it comes to this backwards idea of receivership. I, I'm wondering what we're doing to really present and really flip the conversation around English language learners to being an assets-based approach, both in you know, our school settings, um, and then secondly, what we're doing around native language instruction to ensure that you know, we are addressing the needs of our English language learners and in in, in teaching in a way that they're able to learn easiest. So um, I guess it's a two-part question. Yeah, I think I'll turn that over to our uh, expert at Farrah. I'm also serving as the interim assistant superintendent for the Office of English Learners. We are working towards rebranding the office to the Office of Multilingual and Multicultural Education. Uh, we'll be presenting to the school committee on May 11th. Uh, with that, a policy uh, for the school committee on um, native language and increase in native language, uh, because obviously we know there are, there are lots of transitions and we have been working um, I've been working closely with our executive director and the team, and with that, we shift in a restructure in the office. So right now, uh, we are hiring uh, 12 multilingual instructional coaches, six of which are bilingual. Um, so we'll have two Spanish uh, coaches, one Haitian Creole, one Cabo Verdean Creole, um, one Chinese, and one Vietnamese coach. Um, in, in addition to that, we also have family specialists who are bilingual and serve in those languages. So similar to, again, our um, majority language, uh, languages are spoken. So we have Somali, Arabic, uh, as well as others. So there is a, a more of a cohesive strategy with the new structuring and the new office that we look forward to presenting on um, when we present on the English Learner um, hearing. Thank you. And I don't know how much time I have, Madam Chair, probably none. 45 seconds. Okay. Um, um, I'm also, you know, we saw in the capital plan yesterday there were some new schools, um, and, and it was mentioned that we have to have some difficult conversations. I just encourage, both in the conversation that you're going to have about the new 
way that we're funding our schools, I encourage us to really talk to our students because in visiting schools, you will talk to students and they know what their schools do and do not have. And they're talking to other students about what their schools do and do not have. And they need to be front and center, especially in this build BPS that has left out a lot of schools, right? Madison Park's not included. We need to make sure that we are really talking to students about the things that they need. Why don't they have a basketball team? Why don't they have a, a library in, 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 their, in, their, in their building? So just, um, just want to make sure that we're talking to students and that we're really just talking about built, probably need to have a session on built PPS and school infrastructure just itself. I would love to have that plenary session. Yeah. So thank you. Back May 31st for that. Yeah. Okay, and apologies, I have to leave, but thank you for being here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilor Bach. Thanks so much, Madam Chair, and thank you to the whole team. Um, and uh, special thanks to the superintendent, who I think started six months before our council cohort, and um, it's really been, it's been a whirlwind and a, a, a really challenging season. So really appreciate your leadership through all this time. Um, I wanted to ask, so I'll bracket, I have, everyone knows, like I'm a historian, I have lots of academics questions mm -hmm. about curricula and civics and history and mm -hmm. ethnic studies. Um, and, and then in particular, really want to focus in on the academics, um, on literacy, because it just seems like to me one of the burning issues of the district. Um, and really knowing what we're, what we're putting into that supports wise and what our metrics are and all that. But that's a conversation for Thursday, I think. Um, and similarly to Councillor Louis Jen, really want to talk about the capital plan, but I will hold those to the 31st. Um, I guess uh, two main things. One is, um, and I've raised this informally, but I do just want to say on the record that, you know, I do really think the council needs a clearer breakdown of the ESSER spending. Um, and that's because obviously anything that we're doing in ESSER spending right now that the district hopes will be a long-term investment. Um, is eventually going to come to the operating plan looking for, su for sustaining. And from a fiscal perspective, this body really needs to understand which things that on ESSER side are sort of one-time capital type things and which things are things where we're launching something that we sort of hope we're going to catch the ball on the other end. Um, and I think that while there was a presentation to the council that involved some of the sort of ESSER buckets, those were kind of topical buckets. And what we really need to understand from a fiscal perspective is more this like, What's personnel? What's non-personnel? What's capital? Like, so I just, I, you know, as I as I mentioned, like we can have that as a separate hearing working session over in the ARP, like you know, COVID recovery committee. But I think given all the um, sessions that you guys are having here before us in budget, it would make a lot of sense to just fold that in. But that's sort of a formal information request from me for at least one of these upcoming hearings. Um, and then uh, the main thing that I wanted to use my time for was just to talk a little bit about enrollment. Um, I really appreciate the appendix that you sent over to us of all the kind of data. Um, it's, uh, it's good to sort of know transparently where we are and recognize that you know, some of it has to do with demographic, demographics and declining birth rates in the city, um, but some of it obviously is above that. And I just, obviously that 50 million that was referred to to sort of hold schools harmless is directly related to enrollment declines and when I see that we're at 10% decline again in K2 as last year. I mean, to me, that's a leading indicator. That's a really scary, scary number as those kids continue to age up and we have smaller and smaller classes. Um, so I guess what I really wanna know is, um, like, what do we think we're doing this year that has some chance or we hope has some chance of stemming enrollment decline for next year? Because there's a lot of like big picture stuff and we're talking about like the five year thing and we hope that as we build new schools it attracts people, I get all of that. But, um, and I think we have to have a long term strategy, but I'm also just really worried that we're, we're just bleeding students in the meantime um, and it's gonna put this, the schools in a tough fiscal position even next year. So can you guys just speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I'll just quickly um, speak to one, the ESSER plan is, I hope, going to be out by this week, which is a really comprehensive document. Certainly we've put out a number of documents, but this is a comprehensive document with the worksheets and should we make sure that we get that to all of the counselors so that they have that specific spending and what we're doing by line items. Um, and then I think the long-term plan for Boston Public Schools in terms of enrollment is going to be around capital planning and around a quality guarantee. Those are the two things that parents look for when they walk through the door. Is it an environment that they know is going to be um, safe and beautiful and 
where their children can thrive. That's one. The other is the academic program and making sure that the academic program is going to be one that's gives our children the same opportunities from school to school to school, and they know they, that it's guaranteed that they're going to get athletics, they're going to get art, they're going to get a library, they're going to get equitable literacy opportunities, they're going to have dyslexia taken care of if they have dyslexia. Those are the kinds of things. So the long play is work on the facilities, make sure that they're beautiful and that they have the 21st century amenities that are needed for our 21st century education. Then secondarily, that the academic programming is in place um, and that that's strong toward the college and career uh, pathways that we have um, been designing in our high schools. I think that's going to be a piece of it. And then solidifying the academic um, one point of transition for families, K6 to 712, is going to be critically important for um, us to finalize those that grade configuration so that parents know that they can have this time. And then, I don't know, Nate, if you want to speak more about the other piece. Are we out of time? The ominous bell. Uh, thank you. Uh, did you want to continue? Well, I just, I, I mean, I would like to know if we we're doing anything short term because, you know, because cap, it can't wait for capital. I mean, we'll be down to half the district size by the time we've got everything built. Yeah, I think that the... the Was your question not answered? Enrollment. Yeah, enrollment. the enrollment. Yeah. Short term. Um, I do think what the superintendent mentioned, one thing that we've seen some early returns in terms of um, retaining students is the change in grade configuration. This has been particularly effective at the fourth and fifth grade level at keeping students in the elementary schools. What we know is our families really want that predictability from K to six and then seven to 12. So that's improving um, and getting marginal returns at that level. I think the other piece is we are seeing now more than ever that families want to enroll early. Um, it used to be that we would grow our cohorts from K-1 to K-2 and then to first grade. So each year it would grow. What we've seen over the last five to seven years is that the growth is really gone away. And so if we don't get kids in K-1, um, that we're not. So Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Council Braden. Um, I think I'd like to continue the, um, the, the issue around de declining enrollment because um, I feel that, you know, the BPS is in a competitive market for, for students and we, we're, we're losing students and the city is losing, losing families and students as well because of the increased cost of housing and, that, and, and housing instability is a critical issue in relation to um, how students are able to thrive and, and do well in our in our schools. So it's a very very complex situation. But in terms of you know keeping um, the quality um, capital planning and, and quality guarantees, given the huge decline in, in numbers, are we having? How do we have a serious conversation about exactly how much? how many schools we need and, and, and how, and it's difficult to guarantee librarians and all the different services in, in a huge number of schools if we have a very low enrollment. It's a very difficult conversation to have, but where are we at in that, in that conversation? We have been working with the mayor um, on a capital plan. Um, I think some of that has been um, already uh, provided to the city council uh, for some of those investments. The more detailed plan we had hoped to be able to release in the, within a week, I think. Um, two weeks? Okay. So in two weeks and we'll have that finalized. It touches about 25 different schools and it's talking about, um, you know, where we'll be making the major investments, the MSBA investments. We have a vote at school committee tomorrow on a couple of those. Um, and I think the harder question that you're asking is about the engagement process that needs to happen with the full community around, you know, closures, mergers, and right-sizing the district. Um, and I think that that is the, the hard work that this body will have to do within the communities um, and within our school communities and have those really serious conversations because it's necessary. We have approximately 17 more schools than what we need if you just look at the number of students to the number of schools. And so it's going to be critical that uh, the next superintendent work alongside all of you within the communities and the, and the mayor to 
to have these conversations and then make major investments in those buildings because you know parents see brand new buildings going up they want to send their children to those schools um, and I think that we have excellent educators um, and I think that they're just waiting for beautiful buildings to match that and, and I just want to add I think another thing that we're doing this year is investing in community engagement on designing what a K to six, what a seven to 12 school should look like as a whole for the district. This will really provide us with a foundation of what we want our schools to look like. And I think once we have that vision and once we have that foundation, of course, depending on the school community or communities that we would move into those buildings, you know, things are gonna be customized a bit, but this is a really important step to make sure that we have not only an understanding of our enrollment, but also a, a vision for where we want the district to be. And that's yeah. happening in partnership with PFD. Yep. And um, it is also, we're using an outside vendor, I can't remember the name of that vendor, um, who's going to be working alongside us to do that. And, and, you know, one of my issues as a city councillor is really advocating for much more investment in family housing. All that, so much of our development, we're building thousands of units of housing. We're not building family housing. So. Um, it's becoming increasingly difficult for working families to stay in the city. They, they go to Brockton or, or Framingham or wherever. Framingham is bursting at the seams. They're, they want they need to build a new elementary school in South Framingham. Um, you know, it's, it's this challenge that as a city we need to address the whole very holistically view that education in schools is not just the whole picture, but um, also how do, we, how do we support our immigrant families and our English language learners and, and the other big issue for me is, is, can you talk a little about career pathways and, and how we enable our students to be prepared for the new economy with labs and uh, biotech coming in um, and how, how we can ha ha have support them and their families to uh, have a good um, opportunity to live well and in our city and not have to relocate somewhere else. I'm sorry. Investors at J.P. Morgan. Um, yes, just wanted to make sure I could hear the superintendent's uh, remarks. So, um, great question. I think that especially with our mass core implementation, um, part of that shift. So initially, what we did was an analysis for what schools offered in courses. Um, to match that up with one of the innovative programs, partnerships. So partnerships from J.P. Morgan to Wentworth, for example, which my daughter, um, I'm a BPS parent, is participating in this summer. Um, so there are many opportunities and engagements at school sites, and I think we are looking to expand all of the other career pathways for voca um, vocational certificates. We've been partnering with Serve Safe um, and supporting our SLIFE uh, students, for example, at Madison Park, and so uh, additional career um, pathways that are uh, intentionally being developed in addition to the Mass Corps requirements are part of the new initiative and goals in, in, in making sure that there's an alignment in those investments. My time's up, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Mejia? Yes. Five minutes. It's going to be a long season. But it's season. But I'm going to keep my remarks simple. I just wanted to follow up on Councilor Breeden's uh, question in regards to um, the enrollment. Last year, you guys had a presentation, um, and there was a daunting graphic. I don't know if you guys remember the cycle of unenrollment. Do you remember that? Yeah. Um, which showed that families were taking their students out of our schools, um, and in turn, it also impacts the ability um, to provide these schools with the type of support um, that they needed in programming. So it seems like unenrollment um, and the weighted student funding are closely linked, as we know, right? Um, and so it seems like we're now spending more on students, but students keep leaving the district. Wait, I'm not done. Name, slow your roll. How are we um, coming to terms with the impact of weighted student um, funded on our ability to fund a holistic school program? Um, the first thing I just want to note is that we're seeing fewer students overall. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're losing students or that students are choosing to not go to BPS. Um, they're just, there are broad demographic trends that are affecting Boston, Massachusetts, the region and the nation, which is just, we're just having fewer, you know, families are having fewer kids, they're having them later in life. 
in addition, that the housing housing policy is in, incredibly important for education policy. So, the and then of course the immigration policies of the, the prior administration. So I don't, you know, I, I don't want to overstate that it's people leaving BPS or we do exist in a competitive market. There are charter schools, there are parochial schools, and so we need to attract families there. And so that's part of the work of the quality guarantee. The way that we're breaking the cycle is by investing in those that quality guarantee, that set of positions that is not enrollment based. Every school gets them regardless of size. And then we're launching this big project to say, should we be funding unweighted student funding or is there a better way for us to do it? Um, so I look forward to that, that conversation okay. continuing. And we don't have any masks, and we're in person. Oh my God, my nonverbals are just going to be lit. Okay, so let's just keep it moving. Um, I'm just curious. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the fact that we had so many schools um, send us emails from the Boston Day and Evening Academy, EMK, the Shaw, um, lots. You know those schools, right? And they all want something. And I'm just curious. Um, the current allocation is what, 4.7 million increase? That reflects um, dollars going into facilities. So I'm just curious, like, how are we gonna disseminate? Oh, the amount, the, the amount that was on that slide includes the increase in what we consider part of our maintenance and repair budget. That's the increase in how much we spend to do things like basic repairs to the building, um, uh, Indy Alvarez, our chief operating officer, can give better examples, but it's refinishing floors and upgrading. Like the yeah. Blackstone will probably finally get the, windows and, the, and walls, and the Shaw will be able to Blackstone increase to building. sixth grade. Like that, I want that level of specificity. Here. That so that That's what I want size hear. of the investment yeah. is a capital budget investment, and so we are excited to be launching a new a new build project for the Blackstone. That's part, we're submitting them for the MSBA because what we recognize is that there's not minor improvements to that building that are needed. We need, those students deserve a brand new building. Right, and, and since we're talking about um, these brand new um, investments, you know, the other piece of it is the community engagement, right? Because oftentimes things are happening to us without us and families are an afterthought. So with that, can you talk to us a little bit about what your communication and family engagement plan is going to be for some of the families who might um, be displaced as you all continue to move forward with Bill BPS? Yeah, I, I think, uh, Councillor, we're gonna definitely share a lot more detail in the May 31st capital budget um, hearing. Um, as the superintendent said, you know, we're working very closely with the mayor's office on a number of really exciting projects um, around new builds, around Renovations. So then, on the thirty um, first, we'll be able to dive in. Yeah, and I and I okay. and I just think. So I'm gonna get one more question in. Don't, okay, don't you got me. it. I'm gonna get one more question in. Um, so um, my this one will be the last, and it will be for my friend over there, um, Farah, in regards to um, English language learners. Right? You know, we often talk about diversity, but it oftentimes it's racial diversity, and I'm just curious about how we're including language mm -hmm. as one of the metrics in terms of diversity. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Excellent question. So we are piloting a linguistic um, diversity program with our Recruitment and Diversity Cultivation Office. Uh, I'm saying that backwards. Either way, RCD. Um, and so part of that initiative is to identify schools, the language capacity of the educators versus students, and to be able to actually recruit um, and to place educators in those schools in which we see that there is a high language. Yes. Did you have a? Yeah, I have a follow-up. OK, because so but, but as part of our new office and our new initiative is to ensure that there is linguistic diversity. Um, so it's racial and linguistic, and that is part of our framing across the district. But certainly, we have to also ensure that educators are supported with MTEL, um, especially from our Pathways programs, from paraprofessionals, um, and with our increasing um, support, as well as bilingual programs. Those educators have to be qualified by the state, which is a bilingual ed endorsement. So we are also increasing capacity and working with the Boston College, as well as our internal offices and other external partners, so that educators have opportunities to meet the bilingual ed endorsement requirement. And will there be some accountability on that, like data? Will there be transparency around it? Will we have a dashboard? Will we know how many educators 
Because see, this is my, yeah. my biggest concern Absolutely. when it comes to English language learners, is that you know we have this idea that our kids are going to just adapt to the white dominant culture, but what we need to be creating is opportunities for them to be fully expressed in their native Absolutely. language. And we also need to make sure that we're investing in native language educators, right? 100%. So I'd love to talk a little bit about how we're going to mine that data. What does what does that going to look like? We have some of it available. You got your own mic. Why are you taking hers? Oh, I don't. Oh, I think there's one mic here. Um, we have some of that data available on our website in previous presentations that we've done to the school committee. It's certainly, um, you know, information that we do have available. It's not necessarily a public dashboard, um, but upon re request, we can certainly get some data there. And can I just add quickly um, that we are going to work, um, so we've had recent meetings with OHC and internally, and we need to work with our BTU partners. We do have data on our um, talent ed platform for hiring and recent applicants. Before an educator, for example, that has been in the system for 20 years, we don't necessarily have the data on their language proficiency, so we do have to work with our Boston Teachers Union partners to make sure that we can access that data and be able to provide it. Oh my God. We'll come back. <laughs> Happy to meet with you, but also private. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, I'm going to need to go, so I'd like to thank you. Oh, well, we'll miss you. City Council. We bid you farewell. Yep, thank you. All right, thank you. Happy to meet with any councilors. Nice I'll to see you. To. Have a wonderful day. Councilor? Thank you, Madam Chair. and. Uh, Thank you, Superintendent Casillas, for coming and joining us. It's a pleasure to see you uh, and to all the folks um, from BPS for coming and sharing. Uh, there are two things that I wanted to piggyback from my colleagues that don't require answers now. Uh, one of my questions was also about the $400 million in ESSER funds. I know that we've already allotted $108 million for FY22, um, and I would like to know how we're allotting the remaining um, $292. I know in your presentation you said that you were spending $10 million on academic supports and $1.5 million on athletics. So whatever the remainder of that is, I um, just wanted to also. And um, I would like to also, and I, I think I did a pretty good job at separating my questions for your specific hearing, so please let me know if something needs to be moved elsewhere. Um, around enrollment, what formula are you using specifically to calculate enrollment, right? Are we looking at classroom space, how many teachers we have, how many teachers per student, or are we you know, using square footage of schools, like space available, right? Because I think that when we're talking about being under-enrolled, what does that mean? And what, what formula are we using? Uh, the first question that I have is that there is an expected 16 million in new spending for charter schools. Can you um, talk about how, what the number is for and how that increased investment in charter schools is in or out of alignment with the mayor's vision for BPS or um, the superintendent's vision for BPS? Um, I believe the $16 million that you're referring to is the cost of charter school reimbursement. And so that's based on our overall spending mm -hmm. um, is a formula set based on the state. So, so it's gone up by $16 million. That's correct. Um, yes, it's, um, the way we have to fund charters has to do with the dollar per pupil at BPS mm -hmm. overall. So as the BPS dollar per pupil increases, so does the city's requirement for charters. Thank you. Um, okay, the other, sorry, that just, so the other question that I have particularly is around, you know, the ideal um, teacher to student ratio is about one to 15. On average, what we typically see is maybe one to 21 and the maximum, um, at least according to the Boston Teachers Union is one to 30 or one to 31. Where does BPS fall on that spectrum? And is this budget moving us in any direction in that spectrum? Is it getting us to smaller class sizes, bigger, in terms of staffing for teachers? Yeah, it's actually part of our union contract mm -hmm. um, uh, limitation on class sizes. I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me. Happy to get that um, mm -hmm. for you. Um, but it is not something that you know we propose changing in this budget. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Certainly something we continue to talk to our partners um, at the BTU about, but would want to do it um, based on more of an average at the school versus just sort of a, a universal um, policy for the district. And I can just yeah. uh, let you know that district-wide, um, we are continuing to add teaching staff um, as our enrollment declines. So mm -hmm. what we're seeing sort of district-wide is a um, 
decreasing student-teacher ratio, so fewer students per teacher. Got it. But uh, that obviously varies significantly by school. Mm -hmm. uh. Got it. Thank you so much. Uh, and I have I have questions specifically around spending uh, that particularly around equipment and supplies, is it, would that be a question that I could ask you here or do you think that I should leave it for the procurement and operations hearing? You can try and then we'll be prepared if we can't answer it here. Great, thank you. So there are two, two things. There's an $8 million in education the supplies in department history and there's also a $6 million from the external funds, right? And so is that the only supply line items or am I missing? That, that, that's mostly my question. Are those the two items that represent the supplies for BPS, like the budget. Can you just clarify what you mean by supplies? You mean like paper? Yep, paper? it says educational okay. supplies and mat and miscellaneous supplies and materials. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so as part of our overall budget process, individual schools will set their budgets and their um, put money into contracts for supplies. And then there's contracts and supplies that are used at the central office. So that does represent the current budget for um, supplies uh, district-wide mm -hmm. at this point. What you see is we shift that budget as schools get closer to um, spending, as they get closer to the school year, they'll often shift money in different accounts mm -hmm. um, to put the appropriate spending. So educational supplies will come out of a specific account and then um, contracts like after-school programs will come out of a different account. Um, so it, that, that is an area where you see the changes, but yeah, that's a good sense of the overall budget that we have for supplies and for um, contract spending. And does that include OT, PT, speech, ABA supplies? Like, does the, the, does the supply line item also include <coughs> supplies for special needs students, classroom supplies for their therapeutic supplies? Does it include all of that? Yes. Okay. So the number that I'm seeing in terms of like my calculations is that we're spending about $302 per student per year for supply. And so if that's the line item for every crayon notebook novel that we are spending in school, does that seem right sized? I, I don't think it's quite, you know, it's yes, these numbers are, are, are broad in general, but I don't think it's quite that simple to like break it down in that way. Okay. I think looking at the individual school budgets, mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, Mr. Krieger talked about the Explore BPS budget, mm -hmm. you can really dive into individual schools. There are obviously, um, you know, schools have different needs depending on the students that they serve, yeah. correct? So that's where, yes, there is an overall general fund, and you could say it's on average this per student, but it's really case by case depending on the school. Yeah, and so I think that that's in alignment with the weighted student funded formula in terms of you know ensuring that everybody has what they need, mm -hmm. but I'm a baseline budget girl, so <laughs> if we're talking about this quality guarantee, yeah. which is, you know, I'm kind of trying to calculate the average, then what would you say if you are, what is your baseline? In addition to making sure that all you know st schools have different needs, so you're ensuring that everybody has a different budget, what would you say other districts or is comparable, or like what is your vision, your North Star for how much you, we wanna be spending on supplies? Yeah, and I think that this is where, you know, I mentioned earlier the K to six, seven to 12 design study, that is about the physical space, but it's also about what does the community want to see in terms of the programming and the services and the things that we're providing to our students, right? So this, this quality guarantee has been recently developed and this is the vision for where we as a district need to go for every school, but we really acknowledge we're not there, we're not meeting expectations in those four pillars for every single school. Mm -hmm. um, and so if that's our vision, what are we doing today, tomorrow, the next day okay. to work towards that? Thank you. I have one final question before my time is up. Um, alternative schools in BPS are typically have more flexibility around what happens at the school because they are alternative schools. And to me, that presents a really unique opportunity in terms of transformative uh, education for our students and what we can do, which is sometimes a little different than tr the traditional education that we do at, at the other schools. So can you talk a little bit about if any investment uh, um, is being put towards the alternative schools, specifically the alternative high schools? Um, we have a wide range of, of alternative programs mm -hmm. um, and there's no, I'm not aware of any major investments in this year's budget to improve alternative education, yeah. um, but this has been an area that, you know, I think we need to do some thinking about the portfolio of programs across um, and a number of these programs, as we've seen declining enrollment, you see the need for the diversity of programs, but we do offer a wide range from BDEA, which I think somebody mentioned already, the Boston Day and Evening Academy. Um, and they're working in Dudley Square. Um, 
I was going to say Dr. Lindsay McIntyre will be here on Thursday morning yeah, for Thursday. that hearing, and she's yeah. done extensive work on this and will be able to give more detail. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have no further questions. I do myself, so I'm going to hand thank it to you, Councillor. Okay, no problem. Uh, thank you. Um, Councillor uh, Murphy, first we have to finish the lineup, and then if you want an additional uh, two or three minutes, um, we'll come right to you before we go to second round. Uh, Councillor, uh, sorry, first is actually Arroyo, and then we're off. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, there, there's a number of topics that I could touch on, mental health, uh, Madison Park, uh, build BPS, and the grade realignment, and the, and the problems we've had with the facilities we have and sort of making that a reality and what the adjustment is going to be on that. Uh, but I've decided that I'm going to focus on uh, English as a second language because that, that's a real uh, issue for us. Uh, my political, sort of my first political action was around the UNS initiative, which was a racist uh, initiative that its whole goal, in my opinion, was to put English second language learners behind, and it worked. Uh, several years ago, we were 49th out of 50 states on English as a second language uh, as a state. Uh, the Look Act reversed that, but BPS, uh, frankly, hasn't uh, really implemented the Look Act in, in an effective way yet. Uh, I believe the numbers are 30% of BPS students are English as a second language. Is that accurate? Uh, and so when you have 30% of students uh, in BPS who are English as a second language, we have the Office of English Language Learners. Uh, is it accurate that we've had six leaders for the Office of English Language Learners in the last three years? That is correct. We've had um, interim roles, and we transitioned um, myself into the interim role, so I think I'm the sixth leader in the two years. I'm hoping you stick. <laughs> hear you all. Uh, so my question is 30% ESL students, uh, we've got some catching up to do thanks to the UNS initiative. How much of our budget that is, is actually focused on academics, so not, not building or capital or any of the sort of athletics, but academics specifically, is how much of the percentage wise is actually dedicated towards English as a second language learners? Just hit the little button. The, and there you go. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so um, our current uh, budget proposal for school year 23 reflects um, 110 million dollars in our operating budget directed towards English language learners. Now that includes some of the um, operational overhead as well in the central so office, staffing. for example. But uh, most of that money is in school positions in schools, um, teachers in, who are teaching ESL, teachers in the existing sheltered English immersion programs, teachers in dual language, and so on. And that 110 million represents a 6.3 million dollar increase from FY22 to FY23. Is that about a little bit less than 10 percent of your budget, though? It's a little bit less than 10 percent. Yeah. So you got 30 percent ESL students and a little bit less than 10 percent dedicated to their to their needs. So that's just the 10% the of the budget that is exclusively for yep. ASL learners. That doesn't include the access that English learners have to gen general education classes, to athletics, to transportation. Transportation operations. Those, yeah, operations yeah. costs that would not be coded specifically for English learners, but are a large por part, portion of our budget. Great. So transportation costs, which are general, aren't included in that. Uh, off it, do we know how much of a percentage of our uh, ESL are taking general classes that aren't geared for ESL? Uh, we're, we are actually presenting on Thursday on. Um, so I'm assuming we'll have that number on Thursday? So we can certainly give you the, the data and the numbers and break that down. I will say that the majority of our English learners are in general ed classrooms. Um, and so that's why we are working very closely throughout the academics to support their educational needs. Um, and that there are students certainly who are in SEI language specific programs. So back to your 
um, initial sort of the UNS initiative and the Look Act implementation and where we're headed. That is part of the rebranding and the restructuring of the office. Five million is um, through the ESSER funding uh, now being put towards increasing bilingual education for the office. It's actually 10 million in total for the next two years. It's projected to continue for um, fiscal year 2024. However, that five million, again, is expansive and it is working across departments from recruitment and cultivation diversity, for example, and bilingual pathway programs for educators. It is working with our world languages departments and increasing our heritage language programs and educators. Um, so, so there is an, a sort of a mix in terms of also the general uh, education funding that is towards English learners. Okay. Uh, obviously, I'm somebody who's gonna say 11% or give or take, whatever that is, even when you take out the general and you go into the sort of the entirety of what we have as a budget dedicated to academics is lower than I would like to see it be. Uh, one of my questions for you specifically is when we get to the staffing for ESL, uh, I know that BPS, and it's not necessarily just a BPS problem, I think it's a, it's a statewide national problem as we've had issues attracting uh, teachers of color. Uh, where are we at on English second language teachers? How many do we need? How many do we have? Um, that's a number we can also get for you for the hearing that the Human Capital Office Fantastic. is going to be having. I think it's the 5th of May, but we, I don't know if there's anything we have to say now or not. Yeah, we can pull up the number of FTEs that we anticipate going for English learner programs. And then I guess, uh, so you can do that on Thursday, then I'll, I'll be waiting for that on Thursday, that's fine. Uh, and then, uh, just from a question uh, that you might be able to answer now, what are we doing for recruitment? That's also going to be covered that's in the, on the human capital presentation. All yeah, right, we have that's fine. diversity, recruitment, retention, all of that stuff. That's fine. That's, uh, that's good. I will just add, so we do have uh, one million per year on ESSER for recruitment, cultural and diversity for programs for educators. That is, uh, you know, increasing our capacity for um, uh, recruiting and retaining um, educators of color. So that is a new investment coming on. Um, and Sorry, the details. Say a million per year. Uh, it's um, one million per year for the three years for on ESSER for recruitment and cultural diversity. So my last question is going to be on ESSER. Uh, we did a visit with Madison Park uh, Vocational, where it became apparent that ESSER funding that they were supposed to have received in September they had not received yet. That was maybe last month. And so, how much are we backed up on ESSER funding payments? for our schools right now? How, how far, are, are all of our schools received their ESSER funding at this point, as I speak to you right now? Yes. Um, the, at the delay in schools receiving their ESSER funding was an effort on our part to make sure that all schools had a strategic alignment of their ESSER spending plans. And so what we wanted to do was make sure that they were aligning it to what we call the quality school plan, which is the individual school's plan for improvement. Um, Many schools were delayed because they either didn't have a completed quality school plan or it wasn't clear how their ESSER plan was going to support that specific goal. Then in addition, there were a lot of requests for facilities and we needed to make sure we had the central capacity to be able to execute on this facility um, projects and that was another central review process. So this is an interesting place where I keep saying it's easy for us to spend the money non-strategically and quickly. Mm -hmm. And what we delayed and really worked with schools to make sure that they were strategically aligned. So um, I just wanna, I don't wanna cut you off, but I got a clock yeah, that's no, about to go off. Uh, just on that question, just so that I'm clear, it's, it's BPS's position that any delayed ESSER funding had nothing to do with BPS's central office and everything to do with those schools no, having no, centralized no. plans ready to go? No, that's not what I was saying. Uh, there, there, there was a multi-phase process of, of doing the strategic alignment. I think in some cases there were schools that were delayed in getting us information. In other cases, the lift of making sure that it was strategically aligned um, caused delays in the review process um, and caused delays on our end as well. So I think um, I definitely don't want to be in a, but not saying it was I'm blaming schools or that it was necessarily Madison Parks. But it was the process of making sure ESSER spending was strategically aligned to individual school plans. And was, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a some process. of that review backlog was BPS just not mm -hmm. having capacity. No, I, I, Thank you. I wouldn't. Thank you. We'll have to come we'll back. We'll handle it later. <laughs> uh, Council Worrell, you have eight minutes. They're just, they're increasing it. So I think you have to thank um, 
Mejia for taking it to seven and <laughs> Carlo for taking it to eight. And then you have three more. And right now you have three more and now you I gave you um, seven. Um, uh, we, uh, wait uh, a minute, you can't just take up all the time. And <laughs> you gotta go, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Carlos Morel. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel. Uh, thanks for all the great work you do here in our city. Um, like to ask a few questions. Uh, last year, we talked about a summer plan that every student will have a summer plan. Um, is that still the plan for this year? And where, where are we at with making sure that every student has a summer plan, especially with COVID, you know, the learning loss due to COVID? Yeah, we'll, we will also be, um, I think, presenting on that either at the next hearing or the hearing after that in terms of our summer programming. Uh, I will say for this summer, we are um, presenting to school committee on May 11th uh, with what our summer options are for families. Um, you know, Nate or David, I don't know if you want to speak more to the specifics of it, but we do have a variety of options for families. Yeah, the goal last summer was to make sure we expanded capacity for all of our summer programs for the, any student that wanted it. What we saw is the take-up rate was lower than anticipated. I think people coming out of the pandemic, quite honestly, were pretty burnt out. And so um, we are continuing to invest in summer programming, um, and we've worked with the mayor's office, city, the city office, to work on summer jobs programs as well um, for students. And so that's continued investment. And we, um, the, I would put in a plug that the, um, we are now open enrollment for the summer programming. And so if you know of constituents that are looking for summer programming for their students to please encourage them to sign up uh, for our programming. And I heard this and I should probably verify it, but the summer programs in BPS ends up becoming the second largest district in the state. That's how many students we enroll in summer programs through our schools. And so I think um, shows the tremendous effort that team puts together and they can describe the, the variety of programs that we offer, but I just wanted to, to brag about their work for a moment. BostonPublicSchools.org backslash summer. And Madam Chair, that plug should not be held against my time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> if it's less than three seconds. <laughs> um, what is the long-term plan for BPS school buildings? Um, I know there, last year there was a mention of a RFP to create a master plan. Uh, do we have the status of that RFP? And will there be a master, what will be the master plan in process? Yeah, the RFP that is in place is to help us design what our school building program is going to be for a K to 6 and a 7 through 12 school. And so what that is, they're going to work with us to um, identify what our standards are from a building perspective, sustainability and environmental impact, from an academic programming and from an enrichment spaces. So we can say, when we build a new K to 6, it's going to be for this enrollment, it's going to have a cafeteria, it's going to have a gym, it's going to take up this much space. What that allows us to do as a district is then say, okay, when we go to build a, build a new school, when we hire an architect, we hand them that design and say, this is what you're building on this parcel. Speeds up our process and creates key standards. That, pro that RFP was out to bid. I don't believe we've finalized the selection um, of the vendor, but that project will be launching this spring in partnership, again, with the Public Facilities Department. They're driving the project and they've been great partners with us on that. And we're a couple weeks away from um, some big announcements on our facilities work in partnership with the, the mayor's office in the city. Um, so we're coming back to the council on May 31st to talk specifically about those details. Awesome, thank you. Um, and Council Royal was talking about, you know, the, the investment in uh, English second language students, but in terms of the academic investment for our, you know, general population students, you know, the increased investment in staffing versus, you know, after school programs, tutors, professional development, um, develop, professional development for teachers, um, budget for family community engagement. How much of that was inside of the $40 million increase? Uh, not, not including, you know, transportation or the general, general cost. Um, so of the, the $40 million that we invested, um, do you have the numbers already? Go for it. Yeah. So the um, of the forty million dollars we invested, so fifteen million was for student or school supports, and that's a variety of things um, that aren't um, 
There's a, there's a variety of different supports under those. Um, can, can you give me a few examples of sure. the support? Yeah, of course. So, um, for example, under that, our investment in guidance counselors would fall under that. Um, our investment in school psychologists would fall under that. It's those sort of wraparound services that um, students and families need. Um, then there was also um, and, and, and how much that um, yeah how much was the counselors like that's still staffing yes so how much was how much of that is not staffing uh, in the in the counselor investment um, all of our investment in guidance was staffing we are sorry um, we're setting aside some funding um, on ESSER um, our federal funding to provide some of the startup non-personnel costs, but all of the operating funding is going to staff. Okay. And for, um, is there, so for, for, for when we are making investments inside of our capital, um, is there a needs assessment or is there um, an enrollment assessment? And maybe this is for a question on another day, but just want to Throw that out there. Short answer, yes, those things will be included and we will come back to you on May 31st. <laughs> all right. That's all the questions I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Rowe. Council Murphy? Thank you. Um, two things I want to go back to. I know many of my colleagues were talking about facilities and buildings. We have 125 schools. And I know at the Kilmer, there are 428 students. At Brighton High, there's less students. We have 408 students enrolled at Brighton High, much bigger school. When we start to have those tough conversations, are we going to have a clear list of all of our 125 schools, their current enrollment, and projected enrollment for the fall, and also what the capacity at each school is? That would be very helpful to see. I can look it up, each one, but. Also, the projected enrollment would be helpful because we know many families have already said they're not returning. I know some can wait, many might, but if we do have that um, information, that would be helpful. And what role do you see the BTU playing in that tough conversation? Because I know many times it becomes a union issue. Mm -hmm. Proud union member for decades, so but definitely know that many times schools will you know, really fight to keep their school open, or when we talked about a nurse in every school, I, met, I know many, we have old buildings, right? They were built many years ago, very small. When you have 100 students, it was very feasible to have one nurse go back and forth between two small schools, right? right? So that is another reason why we spend a lot of money, because we have, you know, principal at the Murphy who has 900 students, and the principal at the Beethoven with, you know, less than 300. So. That is one, and if my three minutes run out, I also just want to go back to the athletic question. If we know the value that um, the direct correlation between mental health, physical health, and our students with the mental health crisis, and we value that positive impact that athletics has, why are we, we currently only spend $76 per student, the state average is 161, but we also spend 24,000 per student, our per student spending is much higher than the state average, even though we are now only going to increase it $22 in our budget. We're going to use some ESSER funding, which we know does not last. Once it's gone, it's gone, so we're not making a full commitment to increasing. We currently only spend 0.03% of the total budget per student on athletics, and I do think Increasing it to 98 and then throwing in an extra 20 for temporary funding is not acceptable. I am happy that Jill Carter is invited and hoping she'll attend when we, I have the hearing on May 6th where we'll be addressing the mental health crisis in the schools and really hoping that that and the other panelists there can really get on board to make sure that BPS spends more than just 0.03, less than half of 1% of the per student funding. With declining enrollment and asking for more money in the budget, I think we really need to support that more. But the, um, so if you have an answer to that. Or yeah, I, I appreciate the, 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 the way that you weaved in a number of key issues that are, are very related in terms of the sort of portfolio they operate, the services we decide at each school building. Um, the first thing I'll say is in this budget, the, we are closing three schools. 
um, and two of, two of them, the Timothy and Roxbury and the Irving in Roslindale, um, demonstrate what you're talking about, which is the under enrollment and capacity of a building. What we saw was the program that was offered at the school did not match the neighborhood needs and how we could better serve. In the Irving case, what we're looking to do is build and renovate it into a new K-6 where we can merge two or more school communities in, again, with the opportunity for them to have a better resource, more, more resources. There are returns to scale from going from single strand, one classroom for grade schools to three classrooms for grade or four classrooms. You taught at the Murphy, you know exactly how many more programs you can offer that way. Um, the other thing I'll just mention just sort of overall is in 2016 we did a long-term financial plan that identified five key levers for our district in terms of our overall costs. Those five key levers are still true today. It includes collective bargaining and it, that includes class sizes and the cost of our teachers, the staffing requirements of those classes. Special education, the number of students we serve, those other districts that you mentioned that are spending less per district often don't have the same level of need that we have. The third is the district footprint, which is the number of schools you operate and the cost of operating small schools. The fourth is revenue, and we of course have benefited from significant investment, that three or $100 million investment. It also led to our advocacy for the reform in state funding, which we still don't think the state adequately funds the Boston Public Schools. And I should have had it in front of me because I'm now forgetting the fifth. Thank you, Mr. Buddha. Thank you. I'll come back Thank with that. Council Braden? Um, so in order to develop a master plan for um, our schools, um, you need good demographic analysis and good projections. Do you, where do you get your data from? Um, the biggest predictor of enrollment in, a, in our district is the current enrollment. And so we start with the baseline of how many students we currently serve. And we look at the historic rates of what we call cohort growth, which is the change from a, a cohort will go through from when they progress in grades. So the number of first graders you have, we apply a cohort growth rate that says, okay, you'll lose five students and gain six students, so the next year you'll have more second graders. Um, we also work to gather data on um, birth rates, and we're looking overall birth rate trends um, as, as an input to sort of take the overall picture, but it really does stem from the historical numbers. We, prior to the pandemic, had partnered very closely with the Boston Planning and Development Agency to input the mayor's housing plan and develop a new innovative model that says, how does the mayor's projection for housing and the city's projection for new housing affect our model for enrollment projections? That's about forecasting long-term growth, but for the next year, our current enrollment is really the best predictor. So I'm more interested in the long-term growth because we're, we're adding tens of thousands of units of housing and the mayor has got this ambitious um, program to invest in more affordable housing and hopefully mm -hmm. working families will be able to stay in the city as a result of that. So. Um, you know, I, I'm very concerned that we're not working with, it's a bit like a FEMA map, a flood map, you know, it, it tells you the historic patterns, but it doesn't tell you what's coming in terms of what's coming in, in you know, in the 10 to, in the ten, on the 10 year horizon. And I think, you know, in, in terms of, of our situation in Austin Brighton, I really do hope that we can stabilize our population and keep our families and attract more families, um, you know, Again, we're back to this market. <laughs> we're in a market to try and attract um, um, attract families and keep families in Boston public schools. So, um, you know, having good data. And so, is is your primary source of uh, of data BPDA um, dem demographic data, or and, and then just your birth rate data? Yeah, the, the prime, I mean, I will say the primary source of data for us is our own. As the, L, as the legal educational agency in Boston, we have the best data on school-age children in Boston. And so that is the primary source for projecting. Um, and then once we see, great, you know, K-0, K-1 data, those early grades three and four-year-olds, that then tells us a lot of information we need about what those cohorts will look like. Um, you know, we, we, we do want to restart those conversations with BPDA. Um, 
the, their team has been, the research team there has been great and very supportive of us. It's just in COVID response, we, um, our data analysis was focused elsewhere. Um, but I do think, and the other thing we need to do is, is in, we need to get better um, qualitative information about what families are saying, why they choose schools, why they don't choose schools. You know, when I was choosing for my kids, who are, my son is now in fourth grade, the story was you couldn't get a K-1 seat because they were all full. That has significantly shifted. Now, in a lot of neighborhoods, you can get a seat in K-1, and families may not know that because it's, it's a story that sort of lingers on the playgrounds um, and doesn't, we don't do a good enough job sort of shouting it from the rooftops, but. Very good, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, I have, I have human capital questions, but they can wait to another hearing. Well, um, yes, that or, uh, that was in your second round. I was just giving you additional time because everyone else got eight minutes. Okay, I'm getting additional time. So we're going into uh, second round. Okay. Um, I just have some questions, if sure. that's okay, and then we'll go into second round. Um, so my, my questions are, uh, are, and I'll try to keep them to the consistent time as well so we can get this going. Um, the Food and Nutrition Service took uh, $89,000 cut this year, and I'm wondering how or what does that impact? Like what basically do you have some sort of plan to make it more nutritious and cheaper? What's going on with that? Um, I believe what you're looking at is the anticipated operating investment to support the Food and Nutrition Services program. That's a federal reimbursement program where um, we are able to, based on the number of meals served, receive additional revenue in the form of a grant from the federal government. So what you're seeing is our projected services, the cost of providing the foods, and the anticipated reimbursement. Um, there's no cut to services. As a matter of fact, next year is a very exciting year uh, for more expansion of our um, kitchen services. So all, all but two, I believe, of our schools will have the new cafeterias. And Did you budget $710,000 last year, and this year, 620000 Yes. Yes, so that's a cut of 89000 Yes. So it's the, it's the anticipated, uh, basically, we guarantee a certain level of service. Yeah. Ab uh, um, but the federal government pays for the vast majority of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's our projection for how much we'll have to cover as a city, um, but doesn't reflect a reduction in services, just a reduction in Got it. how much we have to cover for the feds. Somehow the feds will compensate for the difference. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that no clarification. I'm sorry, I, I wasn't getting it when you were telling me, sorry. <laughs> uh, what, so, ba so um, in terms of your um, services with, uh, same with mental health and ESOL, how many, how many social workers are you doing per school? So our um, initial social worker allocation is uh, one social worker for every 250 low-income students at the school. Um, it's a way to ensure equity and distribution. What's the average um, caseload for per social worker? Uh, for caseload, I'm not totally sure, and we'll have to come back at the hearing. Yeah, we have that. a hearing on Monday. So DCF has that average, about over 200 caseloads as well, and it's a mess. They can't, they can't handle it. In social worker level for school, are, what are they doing? Are they doing assessments? Are they doing fee for service? Or are you doing external contracts for that? We, we'll come back on the, the hearing um, on the social emotional wellness for our students where the experts will have more details for you. You've budgeted to hire one social worker per 250 students? Yes, that is what, what is budgeted. What so I'm not saying the case then load. is that the, that's not enough, right? And that I would just say that doesn't include the total services provided at schools. There are additional contracts that we have with providers like Home for Little Wanderers, and then how the, many schools have those contracts? I, I'll need to pull the. I don't have that details. That's um, another hearing. I can ask that in another hearing. You're saying we can certainly be ready for that question at another hearing, but I'll also go back and, and find who has relationships with different providers. The other thing is there are a number of providers who provide fee for service that is paid through um, Mass Health and other um, services that are that are work as a referral system for our schools as well. How many interpreters do you have available or have you budgeted? 
for interpreters and how many interpreters does that translate to per school? We don't have it broken down by school. Um, we can we can talk about the interpretation yeah. and so translations budget. The, the primary method of interpretation um, is through contract um, and outside providers um, because that allows us to be responsive to different spikes in information. So we're adding another um, two and a half million dollars in next year's budget for translation and interpretation. But what does that look like in numbers? In numbers of translators or? In, in schools. There's an IEP meeting, say, every other yeah. week or something. Do you always have interpreters in schools for them? Uh, they have to go through a request process. Do you want to? Yeah, I could just touch on that briefly. So there's a. Talking point in, Li in Lions Bridge. So those are both um, interpreters, interpretive systems. Uh, that have been used especially with COVID and so they have been remote or audio um, less in person but there is a request process in which uh, schools have access to and so really there, it's unlimited in terms of use which is why we've seen the huge increase of, of usage and so we're happy to provide the exact data uh, of how many I think it was over at least 500 thousand requests from this past year but I, I don't want to sort of make up numbers but we certainly can um, provide that information for you and we can submit questions that were asked here today we definitely want them to 100%. be answered there were several questions that I asked in um, the RFI that included and we bolded I bolded the equity questions but in your um, hundred and sixty something report I couldn't find specific like it wasn't separated the way I requested it um, for the equity questions and so it's really hard because we don't you know the chair of ways and means doesn't get a staff to actually analyze specific things specific to budget so there's no um, budget analysis or anything like that so if we can if we can have that report so that we can actually send it out to Boston constituents um, so that they are aware because where we don't what we don't we want to um, have this as concise as you know what I mean and we want to make this as productive as possible so when we're asking questions or presentations prior to the hearings I'd appreciate if we can actually send them separate as I requested because now I can't understand what's going on in terms of equity in the city of Boston we had a hearing where you weren't prepared in the equity budget we wanted to know if Boston was leading by example and how they were hiring we understood that more than 60% of Boston uh, public school employees were uh, of uh, Caucasian, but we didn't understand s specific numbers. And you and you mentioned, look, this is not this is something we have a dashboard. We can give you the high level stuff, but we weren't ready. Then weeks passed, and we asked for an equity information separate a presentation, and we didn't. I didn't get it. And I know that maybe you're still working on it. I'm just asking that you advance that before the hearings to come so that we can proper, we have uh, ample time to properly assess it. Um, and, and that way you're not getting repetitive questions. Sure. We know already the answers and that way we're just answering things that we don't know. Yes, happy to. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, in terms of uh, professional development, you mentioned a million uh, for the next three years, per year, for three years. In, um, in terms of professional development to hire uh, people of color or diverse, diversity, uh, increase diversity in, in your um, employees. How exactly are, will, you, will BPS be doing that? What is the program? What is that million dollars going to? I'm sorry, I missed what the what question What is that million dollar investment to increase peop, uh, employees of color in BPS? So that's also another hearing that we'll have with the Human Capital Office and the folks who do that work, so I think that they would be better folks to speak to that expertise there. Okay, um, and then in terms of uh, your uh, closing the achievement gap, we noticed that there's uh, an increase and that's great, right? What are your programs looking like now and how many family engagement professionals are you hiring per school at this time? We have family liaisons per school. Yeah. Um, I don't know. They're Is that not what called you're... liaisons? Yes. Yeah, family liaisons. Yeah, they I mean... used to be called FCOCs. They're called liaisons now. We, different been, roles. Some yeah, schools still both. have the right. yeah. Uh, there so is, the ones that actually are charged with reaching homes, how, how many of those family, community outreach managers? How many of those? 
But I would say both the family liaisons and the outreach managers do that, right? Um, and I, I don't know if we have the ratios broken down. Um, there's at least one per school. Um, and then depending on the size, it may increase from there. Yeah, so the, um, there is, yeah, like um, Megan was saying, we have one guaranteed per school. Um, and then overall, there are? One uh, liaisons or? One other? of the family one liaisons of is guaranteed per school. Okay. And then we have another 118. Um, the positions that used to be the FCOCs, they had a slight union code change. They're now called community field coordinators. Um, but there are also 118 of those in addition. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess in terms of like reaching um, home or building homeschool connection, mm -hmm. you know, there's this huge investment coming in and I just want to understand more about that or is that, do I, am I waiting for a different hearing? I mean, I think what I'll just say generally about that is, you know, in an urban district, it's not just about educating a child in terms of, you know, math and reading, right? We really want to take a whole child approach. And in order to take that whole child approach, that involves investments in all of the supports that we've laid out here today, the counselors, family liaisons. It involves um, having that quality guarantee that we want to strive for, for stronger student outcomes, curriculum that is um, culturally and ethnically diverse, and instruction that is the same. We want to have modern facilities, right? So this is where we need to strive towards, um, because it's not just, you know, our students, it's about student outcomes, of course, but it's also about recognizing the students that we serve and the specific needs that they have. So the whole child approach means that what, it means before and after school care, right? It means, um, you know, supports for families. It means um, access to translations and interpretations. It means, it means meeting students where they're at and meeting families where they're at um, to make sure that every child has an opportunity to succeed in the classroom. When I hear whole child, I think of social determinants of health and the basics that are not the foundation at home that are not met, right? And therefore, the child is not ready. I mean, significantly, probably reducing their attention to like, you know, if you had like 70% performance, you know what I mean? Probably reducing that another like, you know what I mean? 30, 40%. And I've looked into these numbers and mm -hmm. I think that, you know, ultimately the homeschool connection is where it's at. And so I always wonder, it's not, I, I personally don't think that it's the responsibility of teachers or um, necessarily to reach the parents in, in, because they're inundated and they spend yeah. all that time with students, right? So I guess I think, I always feel like that homeschool connection mm -hmm. is just not happening with BPS. Um, and I know that the responsibility is not just on BPS. Yeah. So I'm interested in conversations in terms of how are we creating a synergy with outside ecosystems to implement that wraparound that you're talking mm -hmm. about. Yeah. And I'll just add, we also have an investment um, in our um, community hub school model, which does a little bit of that sort of intersection between schools and other agencies in the sort of neighborhood or area around the school to sort of bring families into the school, maybe while they're getting other services, maybe while they're visiting a health center or doing something else and sort of helping to bridge that homeschool connection. Yeah, yeah. And to my council colleagues, um, Worrell point, you know, we want to see these, this metric that you are actually implementing to be able to give us numbers and say, we know that, for example, in Roxbury, we understand exactly what's, what, which, uh, how many students here need uh, housing or we understand exactly how we're monitoring our progress and so that if you're explaining money in the future, you say we need that money because of this problem mm -hmm. and this is why, because we monitor it and this is the deficiency or this is the uh, progress. And so if you're not able to do that and the conversations are the same every single time, a beautiful presentation, and you know we're left to have this conversation with you, it just feels divisive and not as productive as we'd like it to be. So I think that the real conversation is to 
start understanding what metrics are we going to start using, but, but a sincere one, like we actually have to implement this. We're, we're having conversations without measuring it, and I have a, we, have, we all have an issue with that. Yeah, I don't, I don't believe I was at that other hearing, but always happy to, um, you know, chat further to see how we can uh, collaborate. And I, I think, you know, what David was just talking about around the hub school model, that is the model where we strive towards, right, and we're, we have a pilot of that. But I, what I appreciate about this body, and I, I think, you know, Councilor Braden, you brought it up, um, Councilor Fernandez Anderson, you brought it up, this is not just about what is BPS doing. This is about the Public Health Commission. This is about housing, right? The interconnectedness of this is really where, you know, our budget, yes, as a single entity matters, and we need to make sure that those investments are strategic and key, um, but it's not disconnected from, you know, the city's overall budget. Um, and so I think that we as, as an organization, of course, have a lot of responsibility on our shoulders to make sure we're I educating. I think my point is, uh, what Council Mejia always says, the coordination poor. Yeah. Like, what, how are we ensuring that we're working on that? Yeah. I'm gonna have to go back to um, do a, our second round now. Um, I think I've taken up more than 10 minutes. So, uh, Council Mejia, you have the floor, and then we'll do another round. Actually, Councilor Murphy, I mean, sorry, Ed Flynn has uh, joined us, and then to Council Mejia. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, can thank you to you, Madam Chair, and to the panelists for being here. Tomorrow, I'm filing a hearing order with uh, Councilor Lara and with um, Councilor Fernandez Anderson on swimming, um, providing swimming lessons and access to um, swimming pools for children and children throughout Boston. Um, it's, a, it's an important issue. We're trying to make sure that every BPS student, but also every child in Boston, has access to um, swimming in a swimming program. So my, my question is, what type of, I know you're doing some work with um, BCYF. Can you talk a little about how you're going to, how you're going to work with BCYF and with students across Boston, making sure that we provide swimming lessons to kids across the city, many kids of color, uh, children uh, with disabilities as well. We want to make sure that as many children as possible can receive swimming lessons. Um, it's a public safety issue, and it's also a public health issue. I don't have the specifics on that right now, um, Councillor Flynn, but we do have student support services hearing, and so we'll make sure we have that information for you then. I would just add that the part of the ESSER investment in athletics is a proposal to um, expand or have the additional staff needed for swimming at the third grade. But this is, to your point, it's still part of the partnership because um, we need to work out the details on access to pools and when it happens during the school day. Um, but that is part of the overall athletics vision for next year. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's important, I mean, it's important for me, it's a priority for me to make sure that we do our best to provide swimming lessons to as many kids as possible. Um, also, providing athletic support to kids with disabilities, children with disabilities as well. Um, and I know I asked that at the, at the beginning. Um, so my final question is, Obviously, I, I represent a large um, Asian community as well. What are we specifically doing, and how is this budget addressing issues that um, Asian students have had a very difficult time with, with, with all students during this pandemic, but also an increase in um, racism, anti-Asian racism, hate crimes, really hate crimes has gone up significantly in, in Massachusetts and in across the country. But what are we doing to protect, to help immigrant students on, on these types of issues? And anti-bullying is a, an important issue. I know that's, that's gone up over the last several years, anti-bullying on, um, over social media. So what are, what are we doing on those types of issues? Um, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, the, the, in, the investment overall in, ter ter in terms of school climate, social emotional awareness does include both um, the 
the need for us to recognize bullying in the classrooms and at the schools and then also the online presence of it. Um, I can ask the team the specifics on um, the approach for, for anti-Asian um, issues. I don't know if um, Fair has any more context on this, but I do think you know both uh, an important step in our overall conversation as a city around um, students who have immigrated from other countries or speaking other languages is the step to move to a multilingual learner vision and recognize the assets that they bring um, and the benefit that they all bring to our school experience. And the, you know this from the many um, cultural celebrations at the Quincy Elementary School. That enriches everybody's educational experience and we need to make sure that we're celebrating other cultures. Um, but we'll cut back to you on the specifics of um, supports that are needed for, for students experiencing, um, as you mentioned, hate crimes or, or bullying because of their um, ethnic identity. Thank, thank you. And my final comment, not a question, but my final comment is certainly the academics are, are critical, but also for me what's important is what happens after school gets out, and including the weekends, and that includes food access, um, access to various social services, support for the parents, support for the families, BPS families, is a critical part, but the, the food access to me is an important, an important part um, of, of a kid's education, making sure the child is healthy. Um, so working closely with the Office of Food Access, Office of Immigrant Advancement, Office of Language and Communication Access. They might be small departments, but they play mm. a critical role in, in our city. And I know my colleagues have been advocating for significant, significant increases in their budget along with, um, and the mayor has advocated for that as well. So just want to say thank you. Thanks, Councilman. Thank, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilman Flynn. Uh, Councilman here. For the record, do, do I have five minutes, eight minutes, four minutes? I can time myself and keep myself on time. It's a small, <laughs> no, 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 I think what I- I just need to know, because the last time I thought I had five, you told me I had eight. I didn't realize that I had eight, I'm so sorry. You had um, five, and then I saw that um, you needed more time. So then I let, allowed eight. And then now we're such a small group. I so think, I just want to be consistent. I think that the consistency um, so is that since we're such a small group, I'm using my discretion to allow as much time as you need because we're a small group. Okay. So I think things will change. And the consistency was that I allowed you first more time. And then I wanted everyone else to have the same time. And I did that. And now we are a small group. And I feel you can take as much time as you like. Councilor Breeden, you feel okay with that? <laughs> She's gonna take up to 10 minutes. Yeah, right. So, no, I'm ahead. not. Actually, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to. You don't want I'm, to? I'm gonna be, uh, you know, I'm gonna, no. I'm not even gonna give you all that much. I'm just gonna say a few things. I'm curious about um, chronically absent students. Um, having worked with the Boston Public Health Commission, the Youth Development Network, for the last, what, 15 years, every summer, I end up spending a lot of time with young people who fall through the cracks. So I'm curious as we're thinking about this work and we're thinking about how we're going to support our most vulnerable students, I want those young people to be part of that conversation. And I'd like to know what is the dollar amount that we're allocating towards chronically absent youth and how that return on investment is going to close that achievement gap that everybody talks about. That's not a rhetorical question. That is a question that I'd like you to talk about. That's a great question, yep. and um, I don't have an answer in terms of that. That's not a lens that I've looked at the budget specifically for. Oh, but Fair is ready to go. Sorry, um, I don't. Hopefully that comes on. I don't have an exact number, but right now we are working with our ESSER um, accountability office to allocate. Um, so we are working on a proposal in order to allocate. Uh, specific uh, supports for students who are chronically absent in conjunction with using their MTSS. So every school um, is required to 
um, identify students that fall in tier two and three of chronically absent. Um, so we provide that data to school superintendents, to school leaders. We know that there are some challenges in terms of the at school level support, but we also need to ensure that there is support of the district. So we look forward to coming back with an exact dollar number, but that is a, a critical area for the MTSS work. Yeah, thank you for that, Farah. And I'm also curious about um, uh, BATA. Are you guys familiar with BATA? Um, and I've already talked about the Boston um, Day and Evening Academy, and I'm so incredibly encouraged that Councilor Lada also brought in the alternative high schools, which oftentimes in the Boston Public Schools seem to be the stepchildren of the district, right? They get very, no, I'm serious. They get limited resources, not a lot of support, um, and they're always an afterthought. So I'm really sad to hear that there's, like you don't have a dollar amount or any investments allocated towards um, alternative high schools. Is that going to change? We do have an allocation for alternative high schools. It's not necessarily an increase, I think, is what I heard Mr. Peter say earlier. But why not? Um, as, as I think the, the, the superintendent's priority has been um, in terms of the return, recover, and reimagine, the recovery funds going to individuals, so each school to build recovery programs. Right, but at those, those particular schools, right, oftentimes are serving our most vulnerable students, right? Absolutely. And so if we're talking about recovering and restoring and reimagining, why aren't we investing in alt ed and, and I in a higher dollar amount? I should say that each of the Boston Adult Technical Academy, BATA, as you mentioned, BDA, they have also received ESSER funding to be able to support their students and do more supports for their students as well. The ESSER funds at the school base were um, uh, were allocated based on a number of, of student factors, um, special education students, English learners, and students experiencing poverty, of which they serve a high proportion. And so they did, um, they do have those resources to be able to invest in their students. And I'll, I'll just add that this is where, you know, when we focus on recovery, we do really see ESSER dollars as playing a really critical role um, because we know that, you know, not all of this funding is going to be sustainable long term. But in our recovery, what are some immediate things that we need? And we did use a formula, an equitable formula, uh, for schools to receive a portion of uh, ESSER dollars that was appropriate for the students that they're serving. Okay. And I want to be super mindful of my colleague, Councilor Breeden, so I'm going to ask one more question. Um, and then I'll just have to go on Twitter and ask my rest. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, you have my number. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Um, but I, I am curious, um, you know, I, and I said this to Nate um, the last time that we met, was that I'm really looking at return on investment. And that every single year we come through these presentations, you guys perform, you know, like, here's what we're doing. And I, I don't see the dollar amount and how that impacts our students in a real way. Because here's my third year here and we're still having the same conversation. And it's very visionary and I appreciate that. But we need to get to the bottom line here because our kids are suffering as I am losing my voice. Could you imagine me losing my voice during this time? <clears throat> but um, I'm, just, I'm just curious if you could talk to me a little bit about the return on investment specifically for EL students. You know, it's great to hear that more money is going in um, to focus on their supports, but I'm curious, how are you measuring that success in terms of spending? Like, can you just give me, help me understand how, how every dollar is going to match an outcome? Can you just like break it down in like 30 seconds. Are you, you're talking specifically for English learners? Is yeah. that what you said? Okay. Yeah, anyone. So the, the short answer is that we're not doing it at the level, uh, at that level. Why not? Um, the, so the ESSER plan does include additional investments for more in-depth evaluation so that we can start to build the both the strategic alignment. So we've done a lot of work through um, Dr. Charles Granson and the, the Equity and Strategy Office to make sure we have a clear district What strength. are the goals? Tell me what are the goals? What are the goals that you're determining on what your success is gonna look like? The overall goals for the district? Sure. Um, the district or are you saying OEG? For EOs. 
for and, you. Okay. And, and so, just to clarify, are we specifically talking about academic outcomes in terms of measuring? We're talking about MCAS. whole child. We're talking about we are been talking about whole child. So I want the whole kit and caboodle. Yeah, like, I, I think talk it's, to me about what that. I think is it's important like. that it, it's defined in that way, right? So that what are the services at school sites, especially in Title I funding, for example, percentage of spending in Title I. So for, let's assume it, you have 25% of your um, students at that school site who are English learners. 25% of the Title I funding must be allocated for supplemental services that aligns to the um, students' ELD levels as well as out of school time, for example, or supplemental materials. So there is additional funding that from um, Title III spending, for example, a lot of that does go towards um, our uh, sort of infrastructure and kind of building out the support systems. Uh, but that also, I think, in terms of accountability measures, that's a different success as far as benchmarks. Yeah, that's what I'm going to be looking for. Like, yeah. I, I really, I think, and Nate knows this, and I've already given him, him my fair warning, is that this budget season, I want, I want numbers. I want return on investments dollar for dollar. Um, because we are responsible for this budget. And if we have to pass this budget, it has to be a budget that I can totally comprehend and understand that that one point whatever billion dollars that we're giving up is going to produce the sort of outcomes that are being presented to us year after year. Yeah. And I think that that level of specificity is what I am okay. expecting from the folks that come through here, Nate. And I keep going back to you, Nate, because you and I have the longest history here, okay? Everybody else keeps changing. You and I have been the ones that remain the same here, except Megan, you got a, a, a you know. <laughs> but I just think that we need to really get ourselves yeah. in order here. I think what would be helpful so we can make sure we're answering your questions is the as much specificity as possible, right? So, because you know, we have to measure everything in, in student outcomes, right? And part of the reason why we are shifting towards the simplification of a quality guarantee is because that focuses all on entirely student outcome work. Whether you're working in facilities or whether you're working in academics, your work should be supporting stronger student outcomes. That's the simple sort of philosophy that we're taking here. Um, and so if there are specific places where you're looking for what is this student outcome as it relates to these students or this school, that would be very helpful. No, yep. she's, she's no. actually, may I? She's actually saying, give me something. She's saying, can, are they doing better in language? Are they healthy? Are they, is it an after school program? Yeah. Got it. Is mm -hmm. there an increase in grade? Is there any, wait, I'm, yes. not, I'm not done. Yep. Are there any <clears throat> progress in grades, right? That's, that's what we're, she's asking. And so when she spoke about the whole, school, the whole child, she is saying, you specifically are saying that your holistic approach to the whole child, and in the interest of creating the synergy between services in the city of Boston, you're saying that the child has to be well at home in order to be well mm -hmm. in school. And the reason why we're clarifying is because we know that this is recorded and this has to go to our constituents, right? So we want to break this down. It's not to belabor the issue. It's so that everyone else at home can understand where we're going with this. And so I, I, I feel like I need to interject because the answer is no, it's not being done but we need to be very clear, you're not using metrics to actually measure progress so that you can deliver the actual, uh, the actual uh, deliverables, right? You, you don't have that. You don't With know. all due respect, that, that's just not correct. We, oh, then we, tell we, me. We do, we do use um, a lot of data, right, when we are mm -hmm. analyzing the, the testing we're doing or the, the services that we're offering. If that is what this body wants us to bring, we can certainly bring more data on student but, outcomes. But, but the question is, how is that, what's the return on the investment? Sure. That's the data that okay. I'm asking about. Do we have that? I think it's ju it's just not, I, I, maybe I'm struggling to understand and maybe we, we should Maybe I need a translator. Is there a translator in this house? Because, <laughs> no, just joking. Okay, maybe, you know what, maybe I can ask the question in, in, a, in a... Try again. No, that's okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you all just slide with that um, for now. Happy to have a conversation, Counselor. Yeah, we definitely need to come back with some return on investments. And Nate, you know this. <laughs> and I keep going back to you, Nate, because we've been having these conversations 
that you all come here with beautiful PowerPoint presentations and at the end of the day, it's like, where has our money gone? Like, how have we ensured that English language and that we've closed the achievement gap, right? right. It's just, it, doesn't, it just doesn't feel tangible just enough for me. And as a parent and as a BPS graduate and as someone who was chronically absent, who was an English language learner, who was raised by a mother that never finished third grade, these sort of things are just frustrating because we keep having the same conversation mm -hmm. and the only thing that changes are the characters that are in front of us. And I think that at some point, accountability has to be 360. And I've said this, it can't just be BPS. It has to be what this body is doing. And we approve the budget. And I cannot approve a budget that I do not understand or really believe in when the bottom line isn't clear to me. And that's where I'm at right now. And that's why I'm so all about the numbers and the return on the investment. And Council Mayor, can I just add to- It's important for me to know that. That we do report to the Department of Justice. Um, so we have several um, reports. So we are accountable to the Department of Justice because of our Boston Public Schools successor agreement. We do report on our services, including minutes of services, grouping, educators. Uh, we have over 87% of our educators, uh, or at, excuse me, 87% who are qualified in retail. Uh, that is the training and, and qualifications that teachers must have in order to teach the content. We also add our 90% of um, certified ESL teachers. We know that there are secondary students, for example, who are missing just literally minutes that have not met the instructional uh, required by Department of Education that we also report to. Um, and so we are working with the Department of Justice and actually have a, an, an upcoming meeting with them so that we're looking at blocks on the ske student schedule. So if a student has, let's just say it's 40 minutes, um, and they're missing five minutes, that that doesn't impact the instructional programming. I think that two things, our office at the Office of English Learners that's transitioning to the Office of Multilingual Multicultural Education is shifting the focus from just compliance to exactly what you're referencing, um, Councilman here, which is quality teaching and learning for every one of our students. That doesn't matter if they're in a sub-separate setting, a dual language school or program, that we have to be able to ensure that we have quality indicators that are aligned to our quality guarantees that ensure that students are receiving high quality instruction, whether it's in Spanish, whether it's in English, and then we can actually look at, here's the difference between language development levels for a student who is in a bilingual program, which we might not be able to see those same benchmarks in English language development because they are simultaneously learning both versus students who are uh, let's just say a nonverbal student with a disability, right? And, and that those students are also receiving ESL services. What is going to meet the needs of that student? One of the key pieces that I think we'd love to touch on is our vision. It is still a vision at the MTSS um, and the cell mental health uh, when I come back with the team to present on because it is to get at your point and um, a counselor, Chairwoman uh, Anderson's point around the metrics for the whole child. We have, as Megan Costello mentioned, Plenty of data, that's not the issue. The issue is really looking at a data dashboard so we have panorama at this stage mm -hmm. that tells us pieces of that data from a whole child perspective. We have much more data that we'd like to integrate into that system and we will be building that out so that we can have this baseline as well as the goals and measures to report on. See what a difference, see? I understand that. Thank you very much. <laughs> I really do appreciate that Sorry, um, sense of uh, urgency in your voice, Sarah. Um, and also because I know your work, the body of work that you've done as an educator in this space and as someone who has lived experience. So, um, so thank you for that. Um, I, and I'm not going to hijack the whole entire time. I know we have a series of other hearings that I can go on and on and on about. But I will say again, and I'm just going to continue to reiterate this is that in order for me to really feel confident about voting on this BPS budget, I am going to need to feel like I understand the budget because I have constituents who are calling on me um, and asking us to hold you all accountable. And I'm not doing my job unless I ask these questions. So I hope that you understand that these questions are are important to have because we have to have an understanding of what it is that we're approving here.
-hmm. It's a big responsibility. Absolutely. And Thank I'm you. gonna let it go. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, just for clarification, you have data. You do not actually have a system in place to measure progress, or do you? Sorry, we do. It yeah. measures different data indicators. For example, we'll have, it has MCAS, MAP assessment. Um, let's just say chronic absenteeism. Again, we do have that with Panorama, and so that we are moving towards implementing that fully at the district. Right now, it's primarily being used for student success plans for students who have chronic absenteeism. Part of the goal and the initiative is to be able to use that with student success teams so that every student um, with identified supports and needs, that we have a success plan in terms of there's a benchmark as well as needs and services that are being provided, and there's progress monitoring. So everything is absolutely done with those data indicators and is being assessed. At the systems level, what we also intend to do is look at what are the schools, not at the student level. Who is implementing that, that, goal, that, uh, that, that treatment goal? Who's that is that? part of my work. I lead the uh, multi-tiered system of support at the district. Um, and so I'm working with uh, t 25 offices across the district. It is a collaborative and um, cross-functional effort. I have probably over 45 members, and we have subcommittees. Um, and Hold on a second. Sorry. Yes. You know the problem. We're not going to keep going. Yeah. You obviously need a, a lot of help. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, assessment, monitoring, implementation, and all this of, of all so, this data. You, your office, in twenty-five offices, or so it's a collaborative effort. I don't lead the assessment office, for example, but there are um, folks from the assessment team and the accountability team. It literally is a cross-functional effort. Uh, what I lead is that multi-tiered system of support, which we'll touch on um, our SEL mental health um, to really sort of describe that more in depth. It is a state and a national framework that we're implementing. But again, it gets us sort of the integration of the data, but the supports that are needed, as well as from the district end. We provide a lot of support and funding. Part of that is that we need to also measure Right, how effective, um, and we do that in different departments, but we're looking at it again as one, uh, one system, how we're looking at measuring the effectiveness of our implementation but, and programming. So we have- Megan said she, you're doing it. So we have data, yes. we have lots of data, right? And so we can, at a moment's notice, say we wanna look at this specific piece. Mm -hmm. But as you all know, you know we report to the, the school committee. Every two weeks we go before them with an update on X topic that the chair decides, and we, often have um, topics that are covered year to year, right, or even a couple times a year. And in that presentation, we use that data to show progress or to show at least where we're at, right? Maybe we haven't made progress, but we've, we've stayed the same. Comparative and analysis so, is one thing. So quantifying things and comparison, comparing numbers is one thing. Mm -hmm. But a monitoring of a treatment and actually getting results yeah. and assessing progress is a totally different thing. And that's not what's happening. She just said you're not doing it, yeah. and you keep saying you're doing it. No, no, no. I, I was misunderstanding that. What, what I'm saying is we do have data. We do look at that data. We do use that data Got to inform yes. decisions, but we Thank don't you. have. Can I just so, clarify just quickly, we, just because I just want to make sure I don't. Like, no, we because, have, we're doing no, that in different no, pockets. No, 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 because okay. I, think, I think you're doing an amazing job. And I just, I just, I see what's missing. I want to go to, I want to be fair. And, uh, Absolutely. Please continue on their time. Oh, Council I'm still here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your patience and. Um, no, no, this is a very, very important. Feel free to continue on your time with. Uh, I just wanted to be fair. I'm sorry, Farah. No, no, it's fine. Um, you know, one of the one of the, the 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 reading proficiency in early literacy is such a fundamental foundation for all for growth and and. Um, so sometimes we, we miss, when we evaluate a, a student's early literacy and reading capacity, sometimes we're, we're looking at proficiency rather than actually growth. And so depending on where a child starts, some children come in with a, a higher level, they maybe have more access to more materials and a, a more different, they come from different backgrounds. Uh, so in terms of, it's such a fundamental piece of the picture. Um, how do we identify students who are struggling with their early literacy and reading and what remedial um, strategies are used? Uh, 
in a timely way, like sometimes you don't just leave it from, from grade on grade and then discover that they're third grade and then they're, they're not at the level. Do we identify problems earlier than that and do we try and um, rem remediate the situation uh, in a timely way? This is one of those questions that I'd love that I could talk about for <laughs> some time, so I want to be respectful of time. So a um, couple of things. Early literacy, there's so much variability in terms of developmental stages. There is a whole group instruction around language arts, for example, as well as small group. Right now, our focus curriculum um, has been uh, developed and still continues, you know, it's sort of in, I think, 12th year or however many years and its stages, continues to also um, be developed and updated to make sure that it's multicultural, that is representative of students' identities, as well as um, ensuring that more enabling texts are integrated. So I think there's certainly an engagement uh, with the early literacy, but the foundations program is the literacy component in which students learn some of those letter sound and reading and sort of, you know, sight words and things that are um, connected to the text. And so if students are not making progress, it sort of goes back to the, this kind of tiered support and what students need to get. Um, so that students can have more of an intensive support. Uh, obviously there are different screeners and reading programs and we have many, many at the tier two and tier three. There was a question earlier on, or in Gillingham for example, we will be providing um, for every school to select an educator. So there will be an Orton Gillingham trained educator at every school so that we can um, distinguish between dyslexia versus other um, reading and language-based disabilities, for example. But the idea is that students are not missing their core instruction and that they still have exposure to that grade level and um, engage in text that they uh, should participate, obviously, in the whole group, but then would have modified and or small group instruction based on needs. Very good. And, and then the other question I had was in relation to, you know, a use of our paraprofessionals. They're a, a very, um, and family liaisons are a diverse group of people uh, to support families. Uh, is, there, um, is there a pipeline to help those family liaisons become paraprofessionals and the sort of professional development offered to, to bring those folks in? They're already in the classroom uh, mm -hmm. as family, and then try and capture that, that cultural and language um, assets that you have in your family liaisons. I think that's a great suggestion idea if it hasn't been thought of already. I want to also honor that our family liaisons do incredible work and that role in itself is really essential to our families and our communities and mm -hmm. it's a different set of skills. It's actually the most linguistically diverse body of staff that we also have in the district um, and they bring so much in terms of engagement and a lot of learning from the classroom. So many have also been in paraprofessional roles and wanted to become a family liaison. Um, I personally, as you know, a parent advocate, feel like you know it's not enough because we certainly could have one or ten family liaisons in the variety of languages, but there are pathway programs that everyone has access to, so they're a para or a community member that they're, um, they're able to attend. So I think certainly we want to make sure that we are growing from our homes, from our communities, from our people, and especially when they um, serve those languages in our Boston communities. So there could certainly be, um, I think, you know, more of an intentional engagement with family liaisons, but we also would love to keep them and, and continue to cultivate them and, and grow them as well in that yeah. role. They're doing incredibly well. They're really work. amazing. And Donna Lashes, who's uh, leading that work um, in the district, is a phenomenal support for family liaisons, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And let's see, um, reading proficiency. Oh, and the other question I had was really about career guidance counselors. You know, one criticism, you know, one notion that the outcome is that if the child, the student doesn't end up going to college, that it's like, that we're going off track. But I really feel that there's so many opportunities in, create, in, tr in the trades and, and um, apprenticeships and, 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 uh, in those areas that uh, just to make sure that you know, our, our guidance uh, counselors are, uh, are, f are offering a broad menu of career options for our young people and that you don't feel like you're, you're just a loser if you don't end up going to college. I think that's a really horrendous um, indictment of our education system. You know, there's, there's so many, we all have uh, skill sets and interests that we bring to our, our work life and uh, we don't all end up, we don't all have to go to college to be yes. success to be successful. So I 100%. think, uh, you know, having that 
broad menu of, of career options uh, and pathways is really important. Um, I just want to mention two investments that we've made, I think, that are connected to that area, which um, we've invested $9 million towards career counselors starting in the ninth grade to um, really support with our mass core, but also pathway for graduation for every student. Um, and part of the restructuring of the Office of English Learners, I'm also adding a special populations team. One of the staff members will be an English Learner Youth Coordinator so that we can identify all of the programs um, that are across our city. There are many, many opportunities that our city provides. And a lot of times it's that coordination effort with uh, special programs, meaning that students who are over age, undercredited, which I taught most of those students, when I was a teacher, so students you know, would arrive at let's say 19 years old, and they're now learning English and then having to meet the graduation requirements. What are the pathways for graduation for every student? And so we will be working with our guidance counselors, the new career um, um, investments for Mass Corps, in addition to the special populations team to be able to really support our most marginalized students and our students that um, you know, at Bata, at Benka, at other city, you know, the, our city schools and high schools that need that intentional support of, of connecting them to agencies and programs uh, in, across our city. And then partnering with our union, um, unions and, and um, apprenticeship programs, etc. The other question I had was about, you know, the opportunities for students and their when it's 16, 17, 18 year old to, you know, some students uh, have a more of an aptitude for a hands-on learning approach and, yes. and being in a work situation and, and learning skills and applied mathematics and uh, using your language skills and all, all of it. Um, do we have those opportunities? I know some places they do, but it's, it's like, so like, uh, half day after, you know, when school finishes go, is there a work yes. setting arrangement partnership that, that, that has been explored that, that it's not just a summer internship, but you know that they would get some exposure to the workplace early on. I know that we definitely have partnerships, and maybe Megan, you know exactly what. Yeah, David. Can. I was just going to say that Oppenheimer will be here on Thursday morning. Um, it works in the high school office on these initiatives, and I would love to let her yeah. answer that question for you um, in the thir that Thursday morning hearing, if that's possible. Yes, certainly, and I know um, I'm probably touching on things that we're going to discuss again, but that's that's very good. Uh, I thank you all for being here today, and, and thank you for all the great work. Um, it's um, it's very most important work we do is is developing our young people so they can be mm. successful in life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Braden. Councillor Rowe. Thanks, Madam Chair, and um, I just have a few questions. Um, one of them is centered around safety. Uh, can you talk to me about, you know, the safety in schools and it's come to my understanding that BPS and BPD has started having conversations. Um, can you talk to me about what information is being shared um, in those conversations? Yeah, we, we do have um, a hearing where our chief, um, Chief Neva Coakley, will come. She's awesome uh, and speak to the work that she does. Um, we, the state law changed um, and so we have school safety specialists in our schools and we have a partnership with the Boston Police Department um, where you know depending on what the situation is we may need to call upon them um, but we really work with our school leaders and our school safety specialists specialists to um, support students in the building and they'll be there they'll be here uh, next Monday May 2nd at 2 p.m. for that hearing okay and um just curious, because um, on the in your in your um, presentation it says academic outcomes, right? What what are those academic outcomes? Are we driving students towards? I mean, I can talk to our um, our school committee goals, right? Because those those are very aligned to academic outcomes. I don't know, Far, you probably <laughs> there's a lot of academic outcomes, right? <laughs> Um, sure, I, I can start with um, our district vision is equitable literacy um, and so we've been working with our school leaders this year providing professional development as well as supporting their instructional leadership team, um, educators, so every school next year has to implement um, the equitable literacy wheel and there are five components. Yes. So w where are we at now in terms of literacy and what is our goal? Um, I can be quite frank and honest with you. We're nowhere near where we need to be in terms of outcomes based on MCAS and MAP data. I've presented this data to school committee. I'm happy to share it back with 
on the, the body here, especially if we're focused on, we are, our best determination is how we provide supports and structures and systems to meet the needs of students on the margins, most on the margins. So we are looking at students who are multilingual, students with disabilities, students who are both with a disability and have um, our multilingual learners, as well as, again, historically marginalized from our black, especially when you look again at um, populations of black boys in special education and or older, and, Latin, and Latinx boys uh, as well um, in terms of communication disorders. So if you start to really unpack the data and disaggregate it, if you're looking at your white and Asian peers, you're going to see that drastic disproportionality. And so our goal, again, is that with the equitable literacy is that we're touching on all of the components of literacy um, so that we are supporting the students at tier one is our, our primary issue of instruction. When we say tier one, it's sort of like students need something different at tier two, at tier three, and it might be more intensive at tier two, might be a smaller setting. But that tier one classroom support interventions um, that it, in terms of alignment to curriculum, grade level standards, reading and writing, engaging with enabling texts that really like, connect to students' identities, families, communities, that's part of the equitable literacy. On the English learner side, we're also developing a bi-literacy pathway so that students moving towards bilingual education have an opportunity to also um, learn to read and write in both languages. And I think we're looking to implement the Look Act as Ricardo, uh, Council Ricardo Arroyo mentioned earlier. Um, so it is equitable literacy and biliteracy, and those are the, the, that's really the big initiative that we're moving towards implementing fully across the district. All right, and, and then once, we, once a student leaves Boston Public School, you know, what, what's that outcome? Is it, we're, we're setting them up to? Yeah, we have, we have a metric. I can send you the school committee goals just for the sake of time. We don't have to go through them all. Um, but one of the, the goals for the school committee is, a, is measuring uh, career and life readiness, college career and life readiness. So um, there's, there's uh, certain metrics that we have around that that we measure every single year. And where, where are we at with, with that? Like, do we know what the um, average income is so for our Boston Public School students? How Average many of income? them have graduated? Right, okay. salary. You know, how many of them have graduated four-year colleges? Like post graduation, you're saying? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, do we have mm -hmm. that information? I don't have that in front of me, but I can certainly talk to the team to see if that's something we track. Um, our senior executive director of uh, data and accountability, Monica Hogan, will be at some of these hearings, so she will have a better sense of um, the data and, that we do track. And can you tell me how data has influenced any part of the BPS budget, any part of the investments we have made? You know, in terms of the outcomes we're driving towards, like how has that been influenced in this mm -hmm. budget based on, you know, all the data that we have? Yeah, I think certainly Ferris started off with some of the data at the, at the start to really look at which students were most disproportionately affected um, by the pandemic. We've also done some work with the Office of Data and Accountability to look across a number of metrics to identify um, which student groups and which subgroups are, are most affected and, and have sort of... Can, can you share with us, you know, those, where we're at now in terms of those subgroups? Um, yeah, we can certainly produce some of the data in terms of subgroup um, academic Cause, performance. Right, because we're, we're trying to, what, what Council Mejia was saying, like, we're, mm -hmm. we know where we're at, like, we're trying to see where we're going yeah. and to make sure that we're heading in that direction. Mm -hmm. yep. And because uh, we're hearing benchmarks, but we, we don't even know what benchmarks we're trying to hit. Yeah. I think this is a great conversation because there are, there are so many different points, um, you know, that we could dive in deep to. Um, and that's where I do think taking a look at the school committee, they have five goals. Obviously, there's a lot more as a district, right? But they actually have, these are the things, this is where we're at currently, and this is where we want to be in a year from now, right. five years from now, Absolutely. right? So that's, that, that might be helpful to look right. at. Right, and then we also want to know where we're driving yep. our students towards. Like, yep. Absolutely. I mean, graduation is one thing in Boston Public School, but we're trying to make sure that we're setting them up to graduate that's college, nice. get a career. You know, those are the things that we're trying to drive them towards. We want to make sure that the data we're looking at yeah. is also producing those outcomes we're all talking about. And, and we also have our strategic plan, um, which we are in year three of five, I believe. Uh, two of those years, you know, were a pandemic, so some of that, you know, work has been disrupted. Um, but Dr. Granson will be here to speak about that work. 
um, and the, the, the six categories that we sort of bucket there and also the priorities um, that have been there. You know, some places we've really thrived and done well. Other places um, we're still struggling to meet the expectations that we've set for ourselves. And, and as Councillor Anderson always says, like, we're in this together. You yeah. know, these are all our kids. These are all our students. Mm -hmm. This is all our family. These are all our friends. So we're, we're, we're in this whole thing together. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't think we'd be doing all this work, right, if right. we weren't in it together. <laughs> right. So it, don't, I'm saying, like, the data is the data, and let's yeah. just share the, the data, data yeah. and, and just work. Let's all work towards it. Uh, is it possible to also share that with the academics presentation? Because we can um, make yeah. sure that we add the um, data to the slide. It's been, again, we, we look at data across the system. That is how we make our decision. And the important thing about our equitable literacy work has been that it's been collaborative. It's a district-wide vision and decision was made with school leaders involved, um, educators. And we have invested in professional learning this year and continue to move that forward next year. Uh, part of that vision for the graduate is also the seal of biliteracy, mm -hmm. so that students graduate with the state seal of biliteracy in both their native language as well as any additive language, um, and so that they can actually um, possibly, you know, have an opportunity at a work or a college level in our career in their native language as well. Awesome. And my last question, in, in terms of data, I'm, uh, Nate knows I'm a data guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that data being shared with any other city department, you know, even after school programs? Like, yes. you know, are we... Like if, if a child is, you know, needs, you know, more help in reading, are we sharing that data with, you know, the after school or summer program that that child's attending? Or, you know, if we know a child um, needs more assistance in housing, like, are we sharing that information with BHA or any other city departments? Like is that, mm -hmm. can you talk to me about the collaboration on that data and with the city, with, with, with yeah. Boston Public Schools and other city departments? I think Monica would be best to answer that, but I, we have um, we do have some limitations on sharing our data because of student privacy. Um, we are not allowed to, you know, share certain pieces of information with people outside our organization, right? So it does depend. We share a lot of aggregate data publicly. Um, in fact, you know, I tune into school committee every two weeks. I feel like I'm doing a plug um, mm -hmm. where we talk a variety of different topics. We always have data in those presentations. And if there are any specific data pieces that you all want, um, you know, those are those are things we could pull to within reason because I don't have access to all. Thank you. Mayor. Right. Yep. Oh, Thank sorry. You, sorry. Yep. No sorry. problem. Uh, Councilor Mejia, you have the floor. Yeah. Just for the record, that's the cradle to uh, career uh, data. Hearing that is a system. Yeah, that's the hearing, right? That's the system. That, that, that's not, I see you. I see she's, you. She's trying. I see you trying to bring you. that into the space. <laughs> no, this is the Ways and Means budget <laughs> overview situation. Okay, <laughs> trying to hog it all up. But though, for real, seriously, on that point though, um, Councilor Rural, you know, from what I understand, forty percent of the valedictorians are making fifty thousand dollars a year. Oh my god. I don't have that information <laughs> readily available, so I well, I'm not me, sure where that number comes from. Let me just make sure I got the globe um, Oh, it's quoted. from the globe? Yeah, the globe um, forty percent of our valedictorians earn less than fifty thousand dollars a year. What's the source on that? The Boston Globe. No the like where did they get that number? I don't know where they got okay. that number, but it is in that it's in their article so you can yeah, yeah, no, I just would wonder if it's so our data or So basically yeah. what it's saying is that even our highest level achievers are still struggling. Mm -hmm. And that's now, and I'll just say really quick, and I don't know why this is loud. Can you turn my volume down? I feel like I'm so like <laughs> loud. Back up from the mic. Yeah, I don't even like to hear myself. It's too much, Michelle. Um, but you know what's funny, though, is that um, I was almost 19 and a half, almost 20 by the time I graduated high school mm. and my freshman year in college I struggled mm -hmm. and that is the case for so many students yeah. today mm -hmm. that they end up in college their first year and end up having to drop out and then occur debt so that I and since we're talking about data I'd love to know how many students are graduating mm -hmm. and are successful yeah um, beyond you know I know you know the answer. No, no, I, I, I just think um, it, it, it's also important that higher education in our CC and Barnka Hill and our partners uh, who have worked with us in Suffolk, for example, um, in, in um, 
and some of our high school students are taking um, college level courses mm -hmm. as part of their coursework, but I think it would be important to sort of think about what is the experience of the student. Yeah. Uh, I just went to Binka, for example, in their Diversity Democracy Day a couple of weeks ago, and I had former students present in there, and they were like, I'm having an amazing time, I'm enjoying it, and some talked about the struggles and challenges, and I think we could all sort of share in that learning, but I really think it's important that we partner with our higher ed um, partners in, in that conversation as well. Absolutely. Excuse me a moment. Um, uh, Council Mahir. It's one o'clock. Is it okay? Yeah, we like to close okay, on time. I'm gonna However, close. That's is it. it okay if you wrap up in yeah, five, yeah, yeah, five yeah, minutes? No, you? two minutes, girl. Okay. I just wanted to just underscore two important things. Literacy, we created a literacy task force here, an ordinance to establish you know, investments in real literacy work. So I'm really encouraged by the work that BPS is gonna be embarking on as it relates to that. Great. I see the, the, the direct connection to feeding the school to prison pipeline because oftentimes students who are struggling with reading and writing mm -hmm. end up in DYS instead of getting the support services that they need. We see that happening at the McKinley. So I wanna put McKinley on your radar and special education is one of my top priorities as well as Madison Park. I didn't give a lot of um, mic time to Madison Park, but it is one of, uh, I'm on the program advisory board at Madison Park. I'm an exponential learner. I gotta feel it and understand what the problem is in order to help fix it. So I've been, I um, joined one of their advisory committees to help support them, and I think Madison Park needs deep investments. Yeah. So that's all that I'll say. And thank you all for the entertainment today. It was really great. <laughs> I really thank do you, counselor. I really do appreciate your patience with me. But thank you. Um, I think just uh, my last remarks are that it, it sounds like um, your, this body is telling you that we are not just going to say yes to something that we can't properly assess. And so this means that in, in the departments for the questions for the RFIs that we sent you, um, the equity questions that we sent you, please send that presentation um, as soon as possible. Um, for all of the departments that you send them some email, uh, letting them know to be ready with this type of information that we're asking you today. Everything that you've got on record uh, stating that's for another hearing, that's for another hearing, or they can answer better. I hope that you can um, then send these questions to them. Um, we certainly will have it written and ready yeah. to ask. Okay. I hope that they're ready to, to answer. Um, if you are not prepared, if they're not prepared, if we can't come back and actually fully assess it, it's going to delay this. That is, we don't want that. We want this budget to pass but we cannot do our job unless you help us help you. And so in order to do that, um, this is a lot to go through. And as I said, and I'll go through it, that's fine. But as I said, we don't have a separate analysis staff that goes through this stuff. So it's for me and my brilliant um, budget uh, and operations director, Amina, who you see sitting over there, who has to <laughs> lose sleep and aggregate all of this information. Um, and so I'd appreciate it if you guys are ready for these conversations. We thank you for your openness and willingness to go through this. Um, it's not as satisfactory as we like in terms of responses. Obviously, it is what it is, it's what you have. We're saying unless we get these things ironed out, um, Please let that be uh, the precedence moving forward, that we want to have questions answered or else it will delay the process. Um, and I think that's the tone that we're setting today. And I hope that you can appreciate it because as you were mentioning with your department, um, you guys obviously need more money, but how have, to Council Worrell's point, how have these issues uh, informed your budget? And if you can't answer those questions, it just sounds like you did it on a very macro level and didn't really fully go into it, okay? Do you have any comments before we close out? No, I, I thank the body for the time today. I'm looking forward to the next several hearings. And we, I took notes as well on the, the follow-up questions. <laughs> so we'll see you next week.
Or no, Thursday. Wait, today's Thursday. Today's Tuesday. <laughs> I was thinking today's Thursday. We'll see you in two days. All right. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.